Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is your temporary announcer, Tom McKenna. For informational purposes, this program was recorded on February 15th on President's Day 2016. The opinions expressed by the participants in the following program do not necessarily represent that of this station or its management. From the John DeVita Recording Studio, located in an undisclosed and clandestine location on the great northwest side of our fair city of Chicago, we once again are pleased to be presenting yet another edition of our monthly roundtable panel discussion, Meet the Chicago Historians. Today we have submitted for your approval, uh, this being President's Day, surprisingly enough, Presidents of the United States. And now, uh, and now here's the guy that started it all, John DeVita. Well, thank you, Tom. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, from the John DeVita Broadcast Center, another broadcast of Meet the Chicago Historians on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, February the 15th, year of our Lord, 2016. Today, the panel will be talking about the American presidencies. So sit back and enjoy Meet the Chicago Historians. And now, here is our announcer, Mr. Tom. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. And now, here's our panel moderator, Jack Red Ryan. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Tom and I go back a long way, don't we? Uh, uh, too, almost too long. <laughs> yeah, you're, well, maybe. For you. <laughs> okay. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. I was wondering, just at the introduction, I was wondering, you know, can we say in the year of our Lord now without offending someone? Or, you know, is that, um, would that be offending other people? It depends or? on which Lord you're talking about, uh, Jack. That seems to be the big uh, right, what, yeah, what's the What's the correct new terminology? Mm -hmm. uh, the common, mm -hmm. uh, common Era, is that it? Yeah, Common Era and before Common Era. Yeah, right. I couldn't believe it. I was, there was, um, they were running a... Uh, I had a Bible study class over at the parish that I dropped in when I was working afternoons, and I was there for a few weeks, months, I guess. Uh, guess what? Here's, here's the, 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 the booklet or book from the companies they had before Common Era instead of a, uh, B.C. and A.D. and Common Era. I couldn't believe that they had done it, you know. They deserted it, too, so. Political correctness. God bless them. I'm sorry. May the Almighty Spirit, if you're out there, bless you. Is that it? Clo it's close Some, enough. Yeah, close. Well, 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 we'll work on that later. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our President's Day edition. Hi. <laughs> uh, I was a little loud, huh? Is that it? Uh, I, we're a loud tie, that's why. Uh, <laughs> well, that's one thing about radio. It can be very casual. Here, well, welcome. It's, well, once again, beware the eyes of February, and it's the 15th, and it's President's Day. Now, when we were all kids, it was... Washington's birthday on the 22nd, Abraham Lincoln on the 12th. Yep. And we got both days off from school. Mm -hmm. We were talking about that on the way up here, right, Bob? Yes, we were. And uh, anyway, it's, uh, well, this has been this way for a while now with the President's Day, isn't it? Well, there's a uh, uh, thing going around now uh, for people to vote on who they thought was America's greatest president. And so far, it's uh, Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. and uh, Washington and Lincoln, of course, are, are close behind. And uh, it just makes me wonder who, uh, not the greatest, but uh, who was the lousiest. And uh, in this poll that they have, it seems that uh, Jimmy Carter and... Uh, our President Barack Obama are winning that poll. Mm -hmm. Oh, that kind of tells you something about today. Yeah, it does tell you. It's I, would have, I would have said William Henry Harrison since he only served 30 days. There you go. Mm -hmm. You know what? And, and I, I got a $20 bill in my pocket, and the guy that, that is on there, one of our presidents. Andrew Jackson. They're trying to get rid of him. Mm-hmm. And he's Better done more for this country, if you really look up his history, 
than anybody. And what they want to put, excuse me, ma'am, <laughs> they want to put a, a woman on there. Is she pretty? I don't think any of them are that were, <laughs> that were uh, Eleanor Roosevelt or Susan B. Anthony or who do, who do they have in mind? I, I don't know. Well, Susan B. Anthony is on the uh, uh, dollar, silver dollar, silver the gold dollar, dollar. My, my, and that my didn't go over very well either. Uh, Bill, my suggestion is for a female on the twenty dollar bill that we wait until the next election, and then after eight years of Hillary in office, she'll be a shoe in to have her uh, picture placed on the twenty dollar bill. Maybe one of the more attractive first ladies, maybe Grace Coolidge or Jacqueline Kennedy. or. Can you imagine going up to an ATM machine? I mean, that's all they give is $20 bills and have uh, uh, Oprah on it or, like you say, Michelle or, or whatever. Well, the $20 bills. I don't bill, think the $20 bill bills would come out of the well, machine. Well, Michelle They'd Obama, I could see, because she was, she was the first ashamed. lady, but um, the twenty Oprah, I don't know. The $20 <laughs> bill isn't big enough to have Oprah uh, placed on it. You guys are unless, mean on this show. Unless they, right. Gee, unless, 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 they, unless, they, unless they enlarge <laughs> unless the bill. <laughs> don't you have to be deceased to be on currency? If if so, kind of, I don't know. Uh, in actuality, on? Lincoln was on a 50 cent That's piece right, during dead, his during his dead, administration. Oh. Dead presidents. Who's that? That's right. Abraham Lincoln was on a 50 cent piece during while well, he was in office. Hmm. And then well, later who, on he got the motors of the penny. Who started this to get Jackson, one of our better presidents, off? Who started this? I don't know. Maybe somebody that didn't like him. Obvious. He did some good, but he did some bad, too. He threw a lot of these Seminole Indians out of Florida. He evicted them from Florida. Oh, my God. And threw them out to the, out to the west. So he didn't oh. do... He, some things he did were good, like every president. Some yeah. good, some bad, you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. A lot of those incidents you got to view through the, you know, the, uh, the, um, through the historical perspective, too. I mean, what was going on then? And uh, I know we... Uh, I know that the uh, American Indian <laughs> generally got a bad deal. Oh. All kinds of broken treaties or whatever, you know. I saw one guy in the um, hardware store last year, and he had on a T-shirt. He was obviously American Indian. He said, trust the government, just ask an Indian. <laughs> I said, well, can I get one of those shirts somewhere? You know? <laughs> so, but, uh, well, well, how, well, how about when they say that Christopher Columbus discovered America when it was already inhabited by Indians? Yeah. Which they they kind of they kind of got shafted there. Hey, <laughs> hey, hey, wait a second. We we were here first. I thought we discovered it. Not nah, sorry. You weren't here. You don't count. No, I, 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 all those terms mean like to the Western world or the European. So don't that, that and what the reference really means? Mm. Mm. Right. You know. Columbus actually got in trouble though. Wow. E even in those days, in the 15th century, was that or no? It was before 1492. That, 14, yeah, 15th century. Yeah, yeah, he got in trouble from the king and queen because. Uh, they wanted him to treat all the people he found converted to Catholicism, and they wanted them treated as subjects of Spain. And when Columbus wasn't finding the gold and the stuff that he had promised to find, he decided to make some money on enslaving the people. So when they found out about that, they got very angry about that. So there was a little bit of political correctness in those days, you know, for, for that century. I would, if I, and in all seriousness, I would have voted for FDR. Mm -hmm. He got us through World War II and the mm -hmm. Depression, and uh, I got uh, good <clears throat> it's a shame that, that uh, I mean, the, the poor guy was in a wheelchair, and he was, you know, the, the whatever you call it, the father of polio. and, and uh, It didn't stop uh, him any, though. It didn't stop him. You know, he still did a job, and he had good people around him, and, and uh, that seems to be in everything. You have to have good people around you. He had a nice girlfriend, too. Well, yeah. I can't blame him for that. Yeah. World War II, for sure. He was the right really a yeah. leader for that. Yeah. The Depression, and the Depression, you get a lot of argument from different economists to tell you that the uh, a lot of these New Deal programs did more to lengthen and deepen the Depression than they really help us with. Well, you know, that's one thing. I think you can get that argument anywhere, Jack. Yeah, no. right. Hey, right. Bill, the thing, the thing that upsets me about FDR is that he was uh, probably... Uh, the biggest influence on preventing us from voting a president in for more than two terms, yeah. because yeah. if it wasn't for him, we could reelect our current president yeah. for a for a third term. So oh. I actually, I'm pretty upset. Then he could too. really mess up. Yeah, the yeah. yeah up in look court. forward. Look up forward to four more years. Up <laughs> until FDR <gasps> took office. 
there was no official rule. It was just kind of done no. on the honor system. Tradition. Every, everybody that got elected said, I think it was James Monroe, they asked him to do a third term, and he started Washington. It, and he says, no, I won't serve a third term because no one should serve more than George Washington did. So mm -hmm. that kind of stuck, and for all those years, that was it until FDR. Yeah. And then, of course, after FDR, it changed, and they limited it to the two terms. I had an argument with the field training officer. He was in, he said he was in three, he three terms. That's, no, he was elected four times. 19... 32, 36, 40, 44, died in 45, though. He so. was only like, wasn't he just like a year or so into the fourth term? He wasn't much into it, yeah. Not even. And then he died, A few yeah. months, really. Yeah. Uh, April, wasn't it? April of 45, he died. And Harry Truman said he felt the weight of the world on his shoulders all of a sudden, so. And you know what? I think Truman but he did. Acted. Truman did a doggone good job, I think. Yes, oh, well, yes, he did. You know, give him hell, Harry was the, <laughs> the, yeah. the one-man show about, about him. <laughs> he was a good piano player, too. Pardon? He was a good piano player too. <laughs> and, and yeah, he used to, who's, the, who's the girl who used to sing with him? His daughter? Yeah, she wasn't so good though. I yeah. should that would have been neat to be a, a record of Margaret Truman, so somebody could hear what she sounded like. Well, I got Margaret Truman, and I got Margaret Woodrow Wilson too. You do? Yeah, I got their records, oh. and um, mm, they weren't the best of singers, but they were you know presidential daughters and you what, know, what, trying for what the what label were they on? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Margaret Woodrow Wilson sung on Columbia. For that matter, so did real. so did Margaret uh, Truman. She sang. You thought Columbia. I was being a smart like. No, she sang. What else but Columbia? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they'd have gotten along good with uh, Bill Clinton playing the saxophone. Oh yeah, on Arsenio. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Anyway, I see him out there in the. He's out on the campaign trail, uh, standing in the back a little bit, <laughs> smiling. You look that, that that smile, uh, amazement on his face as. Uh, that, la that lady that uh, was is in front of doing the uh, talking. So. <laughs> anyway, let's get us an introduction before we get too far into this here shindig. Okay, we'll start with our regular panel members. Starting at the left, Mr. Bill, Bill Kugelman. Retired yeah. from the Chicago Fire Department, 46 years doing that. President of Local 2. And I had my uh, anniversary date yesterday. Uh, 36 years ago, I uh, gave a Valentine's card to uh, Mayor Jane Byrne that uh, we were going out on strike. Mm -hmm. And uh, that. Uh, I thought you were going to say we were going out to eat or something, no, you know, taking her it, out. No, she, you know, and, and everybody thinks that she was so rotten to us and that. Well, you know what? She said uh, to, to Frank Muscari and myself that, uh, yeah, you're going to get your blank, blank contract but you're going to have to work for it and we did did we had um, to work for it. what was your position then frank muscari was the president and you were <laughs> i was the chairman of the strike committee hmm. i ran the strike mm -hmm. and uh uh it uh the 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 end of all of that was that illinois the state of illinois finally got a collective bargaining bill yeah i remember so everybody can thank us for that we uh, worked on that too employees anyway I was but with Joe uh, Muscal with the our organizing, which he never we were never successful with our getting our real AFL CIO affiliate union in here twice. But uh, right, uh, <coughs> he had all the ideas, and he was the right guy. And uh, Joe well, still around? Oh, I know. Yeah, was I, I, retired. Oh, I talked to him yeah. yesterday. Yeah. Oh, did, uh, did. the uh, and it wasn't a séance either. So good guy. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, uh, he had um, he had all the, the right ideas and the, and the experience from previous uh, occupation. Organizing, and, and right? But the one thing a lot of guys don't like because he swears too much or something, you know. So, gee whiz, Frank, isn't that terrible? He never swore. That's bleep bleep terrible, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> you know, and and, and lately uh, I've been very closely involved, president at what time of the Chicago, uh, the Fire Museum of Greater Chicago, and looking at the calendar, we have an open house on the twenty seventh of February, uh, from ten until two. Uh, at 5218 Southwestern. Mm -hmm. uh, bring your kids, bring your camera. Uh, we, uh, we've got some new things on display there. Yeah, we talked about it last time. You have a 1913, is it? We, we have a couple, couple of rigs in there. Well, three, in fact. Yeah. And uh, uh, thank you to uh, Ed Burke for doing this for us. Uh, we uh, we wouldn't have done, been able to do this without Ed's help and participation. Mm -hmm. So that's me. Now to my left is uh, another old timer on the uh, panel here. Uh, go ahead, Tom. Uh, 
Tom McKenna, retired Chicago police, uh, 34 years, and lifelong friend of our moderator, Jack Red, uh, John Ryan, as he was known when I first met him, and one of the few people that still admit to being a friend of John Ryan. And you're also a friend of Joe Mescal, I just mentioned. That's right, and a friend of Joe Mescal. A lot of other friends, too. Mike Tynan. <laughs> That's right, and uh, Ronald a Muller. friend of a lot of other people that no one actually knows is listening to the <laughs> well, show name program. Him. We can, we, we got to fill up these this time, you know. Well, <laughs> Everybody name every friend you can think of. That's of course, right. actually, well, let, me, let me pull up my Facebook page. Uh, I should correct that. We have a lot of acquaintances, but very few real friends. So. There, there you go. All right. And uh, and today you're filling in very admirably as the announcer. Uh, filling in for uh, Rich Lang yeah. and uh, doing. Um, uh, if I make a few mistakes, please excuse me. I'm very nervous. I'm I'm uh, unaccustomed to public speaking. Well, there'll be a little although, extra. Although little this isn't really public, but a little extra in your page. You, uh, you get the you get the point. <laughs> Probably dozens of people listening. <laughs> so. we, oh, we also have uh, uh, another uh, uh, former member here that comes in every so often. And uh, ma'am, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about Kate. Kate's <laughs> sitting here quiet. And, yeah. <laughs> but uh, go ahead, Kevin. Very nice. Hi there. We should probably point out that Kate's your dog. What kind of dog is Kate? That's a rat terrier. Oh, oh yeah. She's a registered <coughs> and, uh, well. That was the breed, wasn't it? They was to dig up a rat hole. They and chased rats, rat. yeah. And that's you know it, what? That's exactly right, yeah. Uh, who Who is in that? It's President's Day is uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. uh, they were going to um, tear down a, a stable near the White House. And uh, tearing down the stable, all the rats that were living there uh, got out, and he got all of his friends that had these, they used to call them fox terriers. And uh, they came around, and they got rid of all the rats around the White mm -hmm. House. Uh, they, could, they could use one of those in Washington today. At least oh, the four-legged ones, right? Yeah. That's right. For, yeah. many, for many, many, many years, the White House was actually infested with rats. Yes. It, yeah. did. it, had, a, it had a big rat problem. Yeah. yeah. Especially the ground floors, like where the kitchen and service areas were and stuff that was infested with rats. Right. Yeah, they had a lot of problems with that. That's why they had these dogs. Yeah. Uh, you you right. dirty rat. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, Kate is uh, retired now from, yeah. from doing that. So. My my, uh, my Aunt Mary, uh, it was my dad's Aunt Mary, actually, he had a dog named Mike who turned out to be Michelle, but it was a rat terrier. It was a long time ago. Yeah. My grandmother's dog dog's name was Punk, and it was Mike, and they chased around like crazy crazies when they were together so anyway but we we, <laughs> we digress uh, and john i would recommend on our next program to have someone to come in and uh and speak in favor of rats because yeah. rats rats have rights yes yeah, right equal time there that, you go that's right equal I mean, time for rats they're world travelers they got around on the city the, the, vessels the, fir the first the first uh season the first episode of survivor i believe it was when they were eating rats mm -hmm. uh off the island, and uh, they marched the. I uh, think I don't know if it was a PETA or a spin-off of PETA that actually marched on the network in New York with signs saying "Rats have rights." Yeah. So, yeah. I, I speak for the rat population of this country. Let it be known. What, what did it taste like? Chicken? It's just <laughs> exactly like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Next up. Hi, I'm Kevin Zaflick. I'm the station manager of Jack FM 89.7 WRHS FM Norge, the station that's airing the Windy City Hometown Network lineup, including this show, Meet the Chicago Historians, and I uh, work at Ridgewood High School. So all you guys today and ladies, you make sure you is doing a good job because uh, he's here from corporate office. <laughs> Checking on us, right? Uh -huh, okay. <laughs> And I have the luck of sitting next to Kevin. Yes, Jeanette. Uh, my name is Jeanette Frontier. I uh, had a show with WJJG for about going on its fourth year when I when I did leave and uh, I'd say one of the greatest parts of the show was that we had a great engineer named John DeVita and uh, he he did wonders for that station it, and it's uh, and something uh, I'm very proud of. You are a panel member but you've been able to come recently and uh, I haven't been here for a few months and uh, You've been on assignment, I would say. I definitely was, and uh, glad to be back. Mm -hmm. And I thought, why don't I come out in a blizzard? That that's a, a nice way of making a new entrance. Por qué no? Yeah. <laughs> so here I am, and 
Go ahead and, and be well, here. Now, I don't know if I should say this on the air. Really, really just saying, guys, this lady has a birthday in a few days. Oh. Well, all right. Let's go. One, two, three. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Janet. Happy birthday to you. Yay. And many more, Thank many you. more, many Thank more. That was a, that was a great rendition. Great rendition. We just set music back about 50 yep. years. Uh, you still have to pay the royalties uh, for that? Yeah. I know before, every time it was sung on the air, you had to pay royalties. Time has the rights for it, but we have an ASCAP and BMI license, so we're okay. Yeah. Oh, thank, <laughs> thank God. Uh, uh, honest, for, Mr. Sachs. And a birthday is a gift. Oh, yeah. So that I uh, proudly talk about it. Uh, uh, thank honest, you, though. Uh, thank honest, you. Mr. Sachs, I never had a lesson in my life. <laughs> I, uh, I just, uh, I, I was born on New Year's Day. And I just hate it when it comes around to the New Year's Day. They kind of took because it away. now it's I get a year older, uh -huh. and I yeah. stop counting. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> at once, yeah. Yeah. And you see, your your poor dad. He would have had a whole year's worth of uh, uh, deduction if you're born a day sooner. I was born 29 minutes after midnight. Oh, gee. So late as usual, I, huh? I. I Virtually screwed my dad out of that money, yeah. and he never let me forget it either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. While you're like here, that. and that's good. <laughs> okay, we on my right, we have sitting in with us today, creator and host of Paranormal Radio, which has heard all of these other stations, and by the way, a friend of mine. He also admits it, Tom. He does admit. I think he admitted it. Welcome to the yeah. club. Yeah. <laughs> that makes two of you, Bob Trezak. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, Jack asked me to come on today for President's Day, and since I had no other appointments, and it does pay $200 to be on here, I thought, well, what the heck, I'll do it. So, yeah. Thank well, you for allowing me to you. come on. And you brought some special stuff for us, right? Yeah, we brought a few. You asked me to bring some records, because I'm a record collector from, gosh, way back, and I brought a few records of some presidential speeches and um, an old one from 1929, Amos and Andy, the political, the presidential election. Wow. Okay. Now, Jeanette, you got some special Valentine's well, Day? You know, we just uh, yesterday, by the way. Jack, I uh, I know we're, we are talking about presidents, but uh, we could segue to something about Valentine's Day. It's only 24 hours behind, behind us, and uh, I think I have a little article here that uh, talks about the legend of Valentine's Day, and uh, I'd like to read it to you. Uh, the story of Valentine's Day begins in the 3rd century with an oppressive Roman emperor and a humble Christian martyr. The emperor was Claudius II, and uh, the Christian was Valentinus. Claudius had ordered all Romans to worship 12 gods, and he had made it a crime punishable by death to associate with Christians. But Valentinus was dedicated to the de ideals of Christ, and not even the threat of death could keep him from practicing his beliefs. He was arrested and imprisoned. During the last weeks of Valentinus' life, a remarkable thing happened. Seeing that he was a man of learning, the jailer asked whether his daughter, Julia, might be brought to Valentinus for lessons. She had been blind since birth. Julia was a pretty young girl with a quick mind. Valentinus read stories of Rome's history to her. He described the world of nature to her. He taught her arithmetic and told her about God. She saw the world through his eyes, trusted in his wisdom, and found comfort in his quiet strength. Valentinus does does God really hear our prayers? Julia asked one day. Yes, my child. He hears each one. Do you know what I pray for every morning and every night? I pray that I might see. I want, to, I want so much to see everything you've told me about. God does what is best for us, and if we will only believe in him, Valentinus said. Oh, Valentinus. I do believe, Julia, Julia said intensely, I do. <coughs> she knelt and grasped his hand, and then they prayed together. Suddenly, there was a brilliant light in the prison. 
Radiant Julia cried, Valentinus, I can see, I can see. Praise to be God, Valentina explained. On the eve of his death, Valentinus wrote a last note to Julia, urging her to stay close to God, and he signed it, From Your Valentine. His sentence was carried out the next day on February 14, 270 A.D., near a gate that was later named Porta Valentini in his memory. He was buried at what is now the Church of Praxidus in Rome. It is said that Julia herself planted a pink-blossomed almond tree near his grave. Today, the almond tree remains a symbol of abiding love and friendship. On each February 14th, St. Valentine's Day, messages of affection, love, and devotion are exchanged around the world. And I thought that was another way of interpreting a day that <coughs> obviously is talked about with candy and and love and, and what a Valentine is, stands for, but it had a great meaning in history, and uh, I just uh, thought it would no, be that, that was that was excellent. And Thank Jim, you. Jim DeRose does the fun facts on our radio station, and he also had a fun fact for uh, Valentine's Day about that. Um, something that wasn't in your story was Claudius didn't want men to marry during wartime because he believed single men made better soldiers. And Bishop Valentine went against his wishes and performed secret wedding ceremonies inciting the rage of the emperor. And that's one of the reasons why he was jailed and executed. Mm. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's amazing uh, <coughs> A lot of holidays that start out with uh, with a background in religion, uh, it's completely removed, uh, especially December 25th when uh, we, we forget that uh, the true meaning of Christmas, which is, of course, the uh, birth date of Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Right. right. Oh, uh, yeah. Not four, I'm sorry. I'm going to believe it. <laughs> uh, or, or like in Valentine's Day, would naturally picture Cupid. Cupid, right? The uh, Roman god, or is it, or is it a Greek god? He's Roma, isn't it? One of them. You know what I mean? Cupid, little little harp and his uh, little arrow, and you know a Cupid's cherub. arrows. But but, but Valentinus, I wouldn't have known that name. Jimmy Valentine, the safe cracker, maybe. Uh, Johnny <laughs> Valentine, the wrestler. But uh, the problem with with what Tom just talked about is that uh, privately we can have all our own beliefs or whatever religion we were brought up with or not uh, but when the uh, emphasis of those holidays comes about it seems like they relieve, release the religious article you know and, right. and you know not having the manger or not accepting the word Jesus or whatever uh, this could be very in-depth mm -hmm. conversation but uh, but then Santa Claus is real you know it's it's a contradiction of the real reason for each meaning and when I did see this article I thought uh, it's another way uh, as Kevin said of, of you know mm -hmm. representing something that we've bypassed here's the origin the, the origin, origin yeah. right exactly you know yesterday I was, at I the, uh, yesterday at the police mass father Brandt uh, brought up that same story which I had never heard before mm -hmm. which was uh, and everybody was taken by that mm -hmm. uh, just didn't didn't know what the uh, well, you know, I think, I I think kid, everybody figured St. Valentine was uh, like the Easter bunny exactly right, yeah. Yeah. exactly mythical, yeah. mythological yeah. very mythical yeah. uh, right. and when I was Cre like, created by Fannie Mae yeah uh, there you are and Brock's candy but uh, all we ever wanted was and Hallmark right. Valentine that had a sucker in it because that meant that guy really liked you. You know what I mean? It was such a difference of Is that what they call us suckers? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's it's so much has changed, and we're losing so much tradition. That, and, and, uh, and, you know, all this business now that someone's religious symbols or beliefs, or they offend yeah. someone else, and we can't display that. Gee, if you go to the Supreme Court building, isn't there a... Uh, a copy of the Ten Commandments and, and like a, a, a statuary or, uh, on the side of the building, the Ten Commandments, everybody? Isn't that one of the things we're all based on in this Judeo-Christian country of ours? But in some places they have uh, 
remove that, mm -hmm. and, and that's why America is not like the America of old. And we lost the gift of talking freely to each other yes. because you, are, you know, people don't want to understand. Speaking of that, and I'll, are I'll, we? I'll say this. Oh, it's break go time. Ahead. Go oh, ahead. I'm the boss. <laughs> I'm the chairman here. Break time, everybody. We'll be back. suffer from pain? Do you know someone that has constant pain of their low back, neck, shoulder, knee, or wrist? Have they tried medications, exercise, physical therapy, or chiropractic, and nothing seemed to make it better? Well, I may have your answer. Why not try a napropath? Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Wayne Chickowitz, and I've been practicing 30 years treating pain. I'm board certified and hold a diplomat in pain management. For your convenience, we have two locations in Cicero, 3602 South 61st Avenue, 708 656 or in Villa Park at 122 West St. Charles Road, Suite 1A, 630 833 4007. Why not try a napropath and stop the pain today? And now, back to Meet the Chicago Historians. Jack? John? John, do you want to say Fred? something about that new commercial we have here? Can you say something, please? I just want to welcome uh, Dr. Wayne Chekowitz, uh, uh to the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network and Meet the Chicago Historians. Uh, I've known Dr. Wayne uh, since March 1st of the year 2002. And he's been a great doctor. He's been helping me uh, with my aches and pains and he's just a wonderful wonderful gentleman so i advise anybody who has aches pains or whatever uh give dr chekowitz a call john is uh, is he a napropath yes he is i uh i i didn't know anything about napropathy i guess you call it but uh, my sister who had down syndrome uh was was in that same type of uh of situation and we found a napropath and that napropath did her a world of good to get her up and going and that so uh, I uh, I'm a firm believer in, in uh, that well, type of medicine be, I guess you be, call it. before you leave the studio today uh, 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 Bill I'll give you his card okay he has two locations one's in Cicero and one's on uh, uh, St. Charles Road, uh, west, a couple miles west of Route 83 mm -hmm. in uh, Villa Park. Okay. Do you have a telephone number or, or a website, maybe? Uh, or I'll, both? I'll I'll, uh, I'll give it to you uh, 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 right after you guys go go back to the uh, go back to your conversation. Okay, we're going I have, back. I have cards <laughs> in, in my office. Get a get a checkup with Chekowitz. Or get checked with Chekowitz. What would sound better? Get checked it's with Chekowitz. And and you know, John, uh, John, that's uh, that's always here with us, uh, Chakoka. Yes. Okay, they're cousins. Dr. Chekowitz and John are cousins. Okay. Yeah. I can't pronounce either one of their names. <laughs> <laughs> well, like don't go to John's house for any treatments. <laughs> 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 so, Bob Trejak, old buddy boy. Yeah. Friends for about four years now. Has it been that long? Yeah. Well, uh, it that's about as long, long, longer, yeah, that's <laughs> long as you're in high school, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Seems longer. Uh, uh, John. Uh, John was, in your case. John, John was the smartest kid at uh, St. Rita sophomore year for three years in a row. Yeah, <laughs> He actually taught some of the classes in his last year. So, Yeah, yeah I, I did one summer school there, I, but that's another story. I told my Father Hartman story, right? That one, right? Go ahead. Well, Father Joe Hartman at St. Rita, was he taught uh, uh, physics junior year. He also was an assistant with the fire department as a chaplain, but not the chaplain, right? Was he an assistant? I don't remember. But that. he was out uh, there, though. Do you remember that? Yeah, he w he was a fire department chaplain. So okay. anyway, yeah, I, you know what? Uh, yeah, I think I remember. Yeah. I do so remember anyway, that. So anyway, uh, I wound up going to summer school for part <laughs> of that in uh, in my junior year, and I terrible, terrible experience because you know it was the first year I could have been working working at the beach and at the concession stand. I had a real girlfriend for a change. She was a real girl too, not just an imaginary one of those blow up ones, you know. But uh, all that, and I had to go to summer school. However. Uh, so, after school period, we all got out, like Tom and myself, we used to go down 
to the fire department gym. Remember the gym? Uh, yep. And Navy, Navy Pier, Pier, which is a beautiful facility. I mean, oh, it, was, yeah. it was the old, it was a naval reserve, was it originally? Or something. It was a huge, like, Quonson Hut almost style, right? And it, you call was, it? it was uh, a, a gym. G I mean, it, it was so huge. Six laps would give you a mile inside. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, they okay. Around the perimeter inside. So, anyway, all kinds of basketball, gymnastics stuff. They taught. They had boxing there. And right. Gymnastics, weights. So, anyway... We got to know, from going down there, we get talking to a uh, commissioner who knew who we were because one of his drivers said, these kids work at the uh, parish working with the, the uh, kids' sports, you know. So he told us to go in after workout and use his sauna, so all that. So, so now uh, It's Commissioner Quinn you're talking Robert about. Robert Quinn, yeah. yeah. Quinn. So anyway, then um, fast forward now to about 1975. I was directing traffic at Ra State and Randolph. Uh, sorry, Clark and Randolph, you know, Kitty Corner from County Building City Hall. Greyhound was there then. And um, the old uh, college inn at the uh, Sherman House was right there. So anyway, limo pulls up, and the uh, window rolls down slowly. <coughs> hey, Red, where's where's Clark and Randolph? Oh, hi, Commissioner. How you doing? And Felix Koch was riding with him, the director of their physical training. You know, hi, how you doing, talking? Yeah. So he points to the back seat. He says, do you know Father Hartman here? So I had my chance. I said, no, I'm that son of a bitch sent me to summer school back in 1963. Well, they got a kick out of it. Everybody did. Oh, what's your name? You know, I was in the right spirit. But I had my chance. Everybody got a laugh out of it. That's my Father Hartman story. Okay. All right. I, I never get tired of that one, John. <laughs> Hopefully that's the last time I hear it. <laughs> it's kind of like Johnny Carson with uh, Ed Ames and the throwing the hatch, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that. See, that's why you were so popular when you were younger with the girls. Those, yeah. those great stories you tell. Well, everybody, uh, well, everybody, run away. <laughs> dive, dive. Uh, okay, we're getting back now, Bob. Right, right. Hopefully, you have another Father Hartman story, but save it for later in case there's we a know lull. We in case there's a lull in the program, the you can you can perk it up with one of those great Father Hartman stories. We saw the alumni banquet. Several years later, and he didn't change a bit. Uh, that's right. He had a portrait in his attic, Dad, though. Okay. Uh, enough with Father Hartman, please. Okay. He, he forgets. <laughs> you know, Jack Jack just kind of forgets. He's gone. He's, he's no longer with us. So. Yeah, yeah. That's the doc well doctor said we just have to humor him, so that's what we do. Hey, man. <laughs> Tom and I had an Augustinian priest as our alderman. We had Father Lawler as our alderman right. briefly. Father, Remember Father, Father, Father Lawler. Father Lawler. He just passed away a year and a half ago or two now in his 90s. Well, up in his 90s. So, anyway, Bob. Yes, I, I forgot what I was going to do now. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I it's totally all, forgot why I'm it's even here. It's another administration coming in, so. I didn't have anywhere else okay. to go, so I'm here. So, did yeah, did you ever, uh, Bob, did you ever meet Father Hartman? Or? No, I didn't. Oh, okay, I'm just, no. che I'm just checking. You're lucky. I can remember when the show used to be on TV, the Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman show, or whatever that was, but I don't know who Father <laughs> Hartman was. <laughs> His cousin. Yeah. <laughs> they were actually cousins? Okay. Was there ever a Father Hartman show, or no? Well, yeah, it was a Father Hartman, Father Hartman. They call Father it. Hartman, Father Hartman. I think it came on before Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. It was on Sunday mornings. But like did the Father the Hartman drown anybody in his chicken soup, too, or no? Oh. I remember Mary Hartman did. Yeah. Anyway... If you're old enough to remember <laughs> these shows. Louise Lazar was that right? Louise Lazar, yeah. yes, yeah. Whatever happened to her? Did she pass away? I don't or? know, I don't know. Is she still with us? I don't know. Maybe I should send she flowers or whatever. She was married to Woody around. Allen. She was married to Woody Allen? Yeah. Oh, I did not know Wasn't that. everybody? <laughs> yeah, at one point. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. At one time, she was, they said she was either in Central Park when somebody, viol some man violated mm -hmm. her, and Woody Allen quipped, he said, well, I'm sure, since I was right, it wasn't a moving violation, so anyway, it was... <laughs> But we digress. You could do a whole movie off of that. That was, ja that was Jack yeah. Ryan, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Ryan. That was Woody Allen. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay. You brought us some presidential uh, <coughs> material today. We can. Yes, I did. Okay. What, what do you have? I have. Uh, we've got Amos and Andy, the presidential election from 1929. Wow. An old 78 record. It's actually an electric one. It's not an acoustic one, so it won't sound too badly. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll just play it. It explains itself. Right? And I'm going to say it's kind of racially charged a little bit, although this one is not too bad. It's kind of tame, so we can get away with it because we don't want to well, offend anybody. Well, it's historical anyway. So. Yeah, so we'll just play that. We'll comment on that later. That is Father Hartman. We're back to Father Hartman again. Andy, tell there me one thing. Is you a Democrat or is you a Republican? Well, I was a Democrat, mm -hmm. but I believe I have done switched over to the Republicans now. Uh, who is the men that is running against each other this year election time? Explain that to me. Herbert Hoover, Vesuvius Al Smith. Herbert Hoover, Vesuvius Al Smith, huh? Yeah. Another thing I'm going to ask you. 
So what is the difference between a Democrat and a Republican? Well, one of them is a mule and the other one is an elephant. That's the way I get it. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if I was going to be a Democrat or a Republican, you know it. Well, what was your ancestor? My aunt didn't have no sisters. No, no, not your aunt's sisters, your ancestors. I mean, uh, how did your old man vote? Oh, my papa, you mean? Yeah, that's it. Oh, papa used to always vote for the uh, Democrats. Well, then if I was in your place, I would vote for the Republicans. How come? Because I ain't never knowed your old man to do nothing right in his life. Wait a minute now, wait a minute. Don't say no more about him now. Well, on the other hand, though, I believe you ought to vote for the Democrats because you look more like a mule than anything I know. Well, I was willing to be whichever is the best one. I don't care. I'm willing to be either one. Well, then let's be Democrats and vote for Herbert Hoover. Wait a minute, though. Wait a minute. Uh, what is he? Uh, Herbert Hoover is a Democrat, ain't he? He was a Democrat. Maybe he done changed over. I believe you got that wrong, ain't you? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Hoover is a Republican. But if you like Hoover, you can still vote for him and be a Democrat. Well, tell me this. I'm going to ask you another question here. What's that? Uh, how you know who to vote for? That's the thing. That, that, that's the question right there now. Look up the record. Look at President Cooley. What did he do during his admiration? He's been fishing most of the time, ain't he? Listen, Coolidge is a Republican. And for the last four years or so, he has done had Hoover locked up waiting to put him in office. What do you mean he done had Hoover locked up? Well, I was reading in the paper right after Hoover was nominated that uh, Coolidge was getting ready to take Hoover out the cabinet. He better get out and get some fresh air if he's going to be president, I tell you that. You know, uh, I had a dream last night about the re-election. What did you dream? Explain it to me. Well, I dreamed that I saw the White House. Mm -hmm. Thousands of people were standing out in the front. And I looked and I saw a man coming right in the White House. It was Al Smith. It was after the election and... Uh, there was Al Smith walking right in the White House. Mm-mm. Al Smith walking right in the White House, huh? Yeah. Herbert Hoover sent for him. Okay, we got a side two to this, too, so... In the meantime, can we, uh, let me see, uh, what do we do, a little... Can we edit this out, or can we just uh, talk a little? <laughs> and a lot of people talk a lot, don't say anything, right? Yes? You can agree. Say it yourself, Jack. <laughs> there we go. We'll, we'll talk about this later, too. Side two. Ain't Listen, side two. You don't know politics like I do. You ain't regressive. What do you mean, I ain't regressive? What do regressive mean? Well, you know what re mean, R-E. Oh, yeah, I know what re mean, all right. Well, grass like you grass something, then sieve like a sieve. There you is. Oh, yeah, that's different. Well, why didn't you say that in the first place? Well, that's just what you ain't. I knows politics. I was going to do some stump speaking. I done smoked as many stumps as you is. I ought to be able to do some, too. Tell me this. Why can't they have a Democrat and a Republican president at the same time? Let Hoover be president one week and Al Smith be president the next week. Ain't no use to have a lot of hard feelings. Amos, the president of the country, don't have nothing to do now. The trouble with that is the Republican would get everything messed up for the Democrats and vice versa. And what? Vice versa. He ain't running, is he? Who ain't running? <laughs> Bryce Vizzers. I didn't say Bryce Vizzers. I said vice versa. Is he a Democrat or a Republican? Uh oh Well, I don't know Bryce Vizzers. You don't know nothing. Vice versa ain't no man. Well, what is he doing in the White House then? He ain't in the White House. Boy, you is dumb. I ain't no dumber than you is. You is just as dumb as I is, though. Now listen, Amos, I told you that if you put two presidents in there, they would mess up things for each other. Well, that would give them something to do, try to straighten out each other. Now, tell me this, how, how many votes do it take to elect a president? Well, one of them has got to have the majority, mm -hmm. and the other one has got to have the plurality. Both of them is bad, ain't they? My grandpa had the plurality, but I ain't never heard nobody having that other thing. Well, what is you going to be? Is you going to be a Democrat or a Republican? 
I was trying to find out which one of them is the best. Maybe if we change admirations, we'll have better luck. Then on the other hand, we have been eating up to now. Listen, Amos, the farm situation. You take the Hogan McDarry bill. Take it where? Take it anywhere. What am I going to do with it? That is the question. It was vetoed. It was? And not only that, the farmers are so mad about the Hogan McDarry bill being vetoed that they is liable to elect the candidate for vice president, president. Well, what do Coolidge say about all this? He do not chew. Well, maybe his wife made him stop chewing. The thing we have got to do, Amos, is to make up our minds if we are going to be Republican or be a Democrat. I believe I'll be a good old Democrat. Well, I'm going to be Republican. You go ahead, be a Democrat. You is crazy. You is all right, ain't you? Certainly I was all right. Then I'm glad I was crazy. Okay, that is that. That's the way the election of uh, 1929 ran, uh, a la Amos and Andy. 30, 1932. <laughs> Two, isn't it? No, actually, 29. Oh, 28, 28. Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool is July 28, 29. Yeah, and, yeah. 28, 28. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, you had Herbert Hoover, the Republican. You had Al Smith, the governor of New York from New York City, an Irish Catholic, or partly Irish anyway, Catholic boy, and he got a he got a heavy lambasting thing for being a Catholic uh, um, to read some of the stuff. Terrible attack on the... Mm -hmm. was, um, but him and his... Referring to him and his Roman masters, and I mean, you know, like... You know, it was the same sort of thing, of course, to a lesser degree that John <laughs> Kennedy went up against. But uh, Amos and Andy, just a little uh, historical, that was a, a, a char character created by char Freeman Gosden and Charles Carroll were two Caucasian vaudevillians who started this whole thing, and they, they did different dialects before, and they hit on this. Originally, on WGN Radio, they had a char uh, two characters called Sam and Henry, and they wanted, it was being very successful with that, and they wanted to syndicate it with recordings, and WGN, which is the Tribune, owned in those days and now, they didn't want to go along with this, so they said, okay, bye, and they went over to, to WMAQ, I think it was, owned by the Daily News, and they did Amos and Andy, just a little little changing of the, uh, tweaking of the uh, idea, they had the same, you know, uh, same genesis of the uh, uh, characterizations, and, you know, as we know, Amos and Andy to this day was, at one time it was the most popular thing on radio, they would actually stop the movie what night it was Wednesday night when they were on, and you would listen to Amos and Andy, then go back to the movies. Mm -hmm. And they said one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest listening audiences in the radio had one. Uh, the former Ruby Taylor, Amos's wife, who was Amos, Amos Jones, wasn't it Amos? Andrew, a Andy Brown, Amos Jones, and George Steve King for Steve, the three main characters who later did it on television, but. They had a, uh, um, a, a continuing story. It was also done, you know, serially as well as being comic. But uh, Ruby was very sick, and they had people like listening, writing, you know, calling. How's she going to be okay? And mm -hmm. um, so it sh showed the power of the broadcast there. Of course, today uh, the political political correctness will reduce it to, uh, uh, especially the TV series for some reason, which was very successful. It was. Uh, pressure from the NAACP pushed it off of after like two seasons on CBS originally. And it was, it, it, was it was like the honeymooners. That's yeah, exactly didn't it, didn't it run like. on radio and TV for the couple of years that it was on? It was like cast on radio one night and oh, yeah, they, the other they was, night. They were still doing it on the radio. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it was a popular show, yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually uh, done out of Lake Geneva, uh, Wisconsin. That's where they taped it from. It the is. original shows were taped in Lake Geneva, Lake Geneva Wisconsin, yeah. Hmm. When I don't know I was why. A kid, I don't know why, we used to go to the 8th Street Theater, which now I can't remember what street or anything, and see a lot of these shows recorded. Uh, and ironically, I did see Amos and Andy, uh, you know, later. Yeah. In the, yeah, later. You in saw the, a radio program? You were there for uh, radio? I saw them producing yeah, it. That's you what know, I mean, you yeah. could do no, that. No, I mean, I don't mean it a joke. That was yeah, uh, yeah, just... Uh, Within my dad's career, uh, we were involved with the WLS barn dance, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they would do different the script. Theater. That's why I can't recall where it was at, but uh, yeah, it, it, I mean you ran home for these programs. You know, let it be Amos and Andy or Fibber McGee, or you ran home and talking about uh, the whole world wanting to hear them or whatever. That same thing happened with the Lucy Desi show when she had her first baby. Mm -hmm.
they claim restaurants lost all their reservations and everything because everybody wanted to be home to be the one that you know witnesses uh, that show and little so little Ricky. Yeah, you you really got involved mm -hmm. in the show. It was uh, nobody up until Lucy was on the air. No, no other. No, no one else was pregnant on TV. No, well, we couldn't even use the word. No, Lucy was the first Ooh. one that was expecting. Yeah, yeah. and do you know, way. do you know the first married couple in on TV that was portrayed in bed together? No, the the, the Clintons. No, wouldn't that be the Brady Bunch? <laughs> mm -mm. You're gonna be very surprised when you find out who it was. The cool. first up until that time, all the married couples when they were shown in the bedroom was always twin beds. Mm -hmm. was uh, it the first married couple to be in John bed together. And, uh, who? Bob, Bob Newhart. Herman and Lily Munster. Oh, Who? oh really? Herman and Lily Munster oh, from the Munsters. They, they were the first, they were first married couple. They always had the edge of the bed. Yeah, yeah, Herman and Lily were the first married couple to be in bed together. I guess they figured since they were such odd characters, whatever, they could get away with it. There's mm -hmm. different production codes. The production code said that if you wanted to have be in the same bed, at least one part of your body had to be on the floor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were a really nasty writer, you could come up with some really strange situations <laughs> and still be, still be with the censors. I mm know -hmm. no, I could. But Lucy and Desi, every time it was a bedroom scene, it was always twin beds. Rob and Laura Petrie was always twin right. beds. They were always twin beds, you know, mm -hmm. up until Herman and Lily Munster. Their first couple How about of bed bunk together. beds? Were bunk beds been okay then? Or it could have. <laughs> that could have worked. Except it would have been hard to get your foot on the floor from that second oh. bunk on the top. <laughs> Unless you were really long. Now you can see all of those on, yeah. what is it, Emmy TV? Oh, yeah, they show all that stuff. Yeah, and yeah, all yeah, of, yeah, yeah, all of them. And I tell you what. They are very popular oh, yeah. now, mm -hmm. too. People yeah. realize how good a, mm -hmm. uh, 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 entertainment was back then. Uh. Well, just like your movies, uh, I, I hope I'm not segueing, but, and I'm sure Kevin could make these things authentic. Uh, if you look at your old, what we call old movies, 40, 50, 60 years ago, uh, everybody's smoking. Everybody, mm -hmm. every woman, Tele every man. television shows too. Right, exactly. And and we were just talking about uh, the Lucy. Uh, I love Lucy. Everybody smoked. They had the well, light, Philip light, Morris. Light. Philip Morris was the sponsor of the show. There so you go. Yeah, sure. well, exactly. Right. For you years, know, Lucky Strike was Jack Benny's sponsor on radio and TV for right. a while. Yeah. You know? Right. So yeah. You know, and that was one of the first things they tried taking out of the scripts because, uh, you know, it was a natural thing to do, but it now promoted smoking so i think they even paid guests more money like if a guest came on one of the shows if it was a game show or a talk show whatever if a guest came on and was sm smoking one of their cigarettes or something and mentioned it they actually paid him a little more money they oh, slipped sure. him a little more money for well, saying their name on the air you know movies do that now they they now show you the brand name of what they're using right. or if they were drinking a certain pop or uh, using a certain product and they get good money we for doing that. We did it in that. the Super Bowl here uh, uh -huh. a week ago. There you are. That's Peyton a good Manning, example. Peyton uh, Manning <laughs> coming up with, uh, what did he say? He was going to drink some Budweiser. Budweiser. Uh -huh. That's right, too. Uh -huh. yeah. The only one that got in trouble with one of his sponsors on the air was Henry Morgan. Lifesavers was one of his sponsors, and he said Lifesavers was cheating the people because they left a hole in their Lifesavers, so uh, they weren't getting their full money's worth. Get oh, yeah. They weren't getting, <laughs> so he got in trouble. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well. So he insulted his sponsors, which was not the thing you want to do. Right. Sponsors are very, very sensitive mm -hmm. about their product. Absolutely. They, sure. Product Buddy, placement. Buddy Hackett, Buddy Hackett tells a story. I saw him in Las Vegas, and he was the spokesperson for Frito-Lay, and they had their corporate uh, convention and the president of Frito Lay w introduced him as the our our spokesman. He got a round of applause. He went up to the podium and he told the president uh, of Frito Lay. He said, "I love Frito Lay. I eat them all the time." And uh, and the president says, "Oh, really? Do you, buddy?" And he said, "Hey, for a million dollars a year, I'd eat dog shit." <laughs> Ooh. And <laughs> and the next morning, it was he said, it. his his agent called him at home, and he said, "Hey, before you say anything, let me tell you this great line that I said to the president of Frito Lay." Yeah. And he said, "I already know about it, buddy. You're fired." You're You're fired. fired. <laughs> yeah, they kind of no, did it. No, no, yeah. no sense of humor when it comes to their product. Yeah. Yeah. I know I have some uh, videos, you know, old videos of uh, some programs, and one one of the cop shows early. It was a good one too, called The Lineup. Was on CBS. It was kind of like their answer to Dragnet. It was in San Francisco. And looking at it, it was pretty realistic. 
the two detectives were Warner Anderson and Tom Tully. And of course, they're driving up and down the hills there. They, you know, anyway, in one spot, he he stopped in the station, and there he makes sure he shows his pack of viceroys very well as he's giving syrup to somebody else. So that was their sponsor. So exactly, and they and they got you know paid for that. Well, they were the big advertisers: mm-hmm. beer, mm-hmm. cigarettes, and cars. Well, I cho- mm-hmm. Sure, I chose that were uh, sponsored by Ford. You only saw Fords in the in the uh, series. Mm-hmm. Here's one too: the old Jack Benny's are on some of the uh, stations now. The uh, I remember when they were showing some of his older shows over the summer. You know, like instead of replacements, and he was Lipton Tea was a sponsor. So he's at the one in the breakfast. He's having breakfast, and he says, "Would you care for some?" And you could tell they they change coffee to tea in the uh, the soundtrack just for that reason so anyway what do we got else here back to the presidents now yeah i was gonna say we lost the president no it's okay that's yeah we, we lost <laughs> great minds are that way we just we just embrace everything uh if you don't mind i have something interesting on uh, fdr okay uh, I, I wrote know, a, i wrote a I story on uh, mayor daly but he wiped it off <laughs> well if i can get it open all right, uh, we did discuss uh, FDR, and just ironically, you all made some comments that I might be repeating. Uh, on Tuesday, January 20th, 09, Barack Obama was inaug- inaug- inaugurated into office as the 44th President of the United States. He certainly has his work cut out for him with the failing economy and the unemployment and uh, just one of many, one and two of many problems. He is the first Afro-American to be elected United States president. Well, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, was the 32nd president of the United States, and he had a lot of firsts. He was the first and only president to serve more than two terms, being elected four times in 1932, 36, 40, and 44. He was the first U.S. president to fly in an airplane while in office. He was also the first to appear on television. Roosevelt was the first and only U.S. president with polio, having contracted the disease in 1921. He was unable to walk unaided, and he used a wheelchair for the rest of his life a fact that most Americans did not know about until after his death. The public never saw him in his wheelchair. A life-size uh, statue by artist Robert Graham of President, uh, is of President Roosevelt in his wheelchair is installed at the entrance to the FDR uh, in... Uh, Memorial in Washington, D.C. FDR was faced with uh, similar but much more serious problems as President Obama is facing today. President Roosevelt is most widely remembered for being a central figure during a time of worldwide economic crisis and world war. During the Great Depression of the 1930s, He created the New Deal to provide relief for the unemployed, recovery of the economy, and a reform of the economic and reform of the economic and banking systems through agencies such as Work uh, Works Project uh, Administration, which is the WPA, National Recovery Administration, which is the NRA, and the Agricultural. Adjustment uh, Administration, which is the AAA. Other legacies include the National Labor Relations Board, NLRB, and the Social Security System. Roosevelt was related by blood or through marriage to 11 former presidents. Theodore Roosevelt was FDR's fifth cousin. Uh, Theodore's niece, Eleanor Roosevelt, became FDR's wife in 1902. Eleanor and Franklin were fifth cousins once removed, and President Roosevelt died on April 12, 
1945 during his fourth term just before the end of the Second World War. Um, I thought those were interesting facts. No. Um, not that they're, um, you know, earth-shaking, but by the same oh. token, uh, we don't always know a lot about the personal life. Every, everyone should be uh, uh, r reminded, and that the signal, for getting John's signal, this, this submarine signal means it's time for a break. And it was perfect timing, by the way. Tom? And now, for a brief intermission, you're listening to Meet the Chicago Historians. Oh. It was a good time. Perfect. Friends, are you looking for a place to have some printing done? Well, I have the right place for you to go, and that is the printing store in Oak Park, Illinois. Call or see Phil Berry at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois, or call 708-383-3638. Phil will sit down with you and help you plan whatever you need printed. Now his products are brochures, booklets, business cards, catalogs, envelopes, letterheads, flyers, invitations, newsletters, notepads, menus, mailers, manuals, labels, posters, postcards, price lists, NCR forms, cell sheets, table tents, pocket folders, and presentation forms. And his services include one to four color offset printing, digital copying, high speed copying, graphic designs, typesetting, laminating, foil stamping, die cutting, and imprinting. And he also has a complete binary service which includes booklets, cutting, scoring, folding, numbering, padding, and drilling. So once again, for all your printing needs, See or call Phil Berry at the printing store at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois, or call 708-383-3638. And once again, they are located at Madison Street and Clarence Avenue, just east of Oak Park Avenue. And it's at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, or call 708-383-3638. And ask to speak to. And now back to meet the Chicago historians, Jack. Who do I throw it to? I guess this is as Harry Truman said. This is where the book passing stops. <laughs> so anyway, listen. We've had some very, very good information today. Thank you very much, Jeanette. Thank you. It's so good to see you here. It's so nice to be back, and I yeah. hope I can continue doing that. Yeah, let's hope so. Now, Bob, you got something else for us? Uh, some other recording? Yeah, or? nothing, uh, not a humorous recording. Well, if you want to consider it. Yeah, it depends <laughs> on how you look at it. Yeah. Right around, uh, right around 1919, 1920, Columbia decided to do these records called The Nation's Forum. They're kind of rare recordings to come by today. Of course, there were 78 RPMs, and they were presidential speeches by the presidents that were around then and that. And uh, this one happens to be Warren G. Harding, who's actually senator. He was just running for office then, so it had to be right around 1919, 1920, just before he got elected to the presidency, and he's given a little speech there. Um, it's about four minutes long. I won't play the whole thing because it gets a little tedious, but we'll play some of it just so you can hear Warren G. Harding's voice. Mm -hmm. And we will get that rolling. Now, folks, this is on 78 RPM. Your kids don't know what those records are, but we'll tell you later. an undying cause. It's the guiding light, the song, the prayer, the confirmation for our own people. Although we were never assured in this liberal union until the Civil War was fought, 
Can any red-blooded American consent now, when we have come to understand its priceless value, to merge our nationality into internationality, merely because brotherhood and fraternity and fellowship and peace are soothing and appealing terms? Out of the ferment, the turmoil, the debt and echoing sorrows, out of the appalling waste and far-reaching disorder, out of the threats against orderly government and the assaults on our present-day civilization, I think, sirs, I can see the opening way for America. We must preserve the inheritance and cling to just government. We do not need and we do not mean to live within and for ourselves alone, but we do mean to hold our ideals safe from foreign incursion. We have commanded respect and confidence, commanded them in the friendships and the associations of peace, commanded them in the conflicts and comradeships of war. It's easily possible to hold the world's high estimate through righteous relationships, if our ideals of civilization are the best in the world, and I proudly believe that they are, then we ought to send the American torch bearers leading on to fulfillment. America aided in saving civilization. Americans will not fail civilization in the deliberate advancement of peace. We're willing to give, but we resent demand. I do not believe, senators, that it's going to break the heart of the world to make this covenant right, or at least free it from perils which would endanger our own independence. Yeah, very, okay, very interesting. Is, interesting, yeah. isn't it? Is you know what? That reminded me of uh, Al Sharpton's speech uh, here a couple of months ago. Yeah, that was Warren G. Harding yeah. addressing the Senate when he himself was a senator just before he got elected to the presidency. Or pushed into the presidency, whatever you want to say. Well, in that, in that brief snippet, we also had some ideas that seemed like they'd be very <laughs> applicable today. I mean, uh, nothing about much our changes. own ideas yeah, not nothing. being corrupted by foreign. Uh, yeah, some things change and some things don't. Yeah, yeah. Hist and history, as we all know, repeats itself. So, yeah. Oh no, not that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Th those who are don't know history are repeated to, are doomed to repeat it or something or. Who should we talk about? Should we pick a president? I, wrote, I was going to say... I wrote down the 44 of them here. Okay, I, I oh, go ahead. I'm glad you did it. I counted it twice <coughs> just to, to see if I made a mistake Now, here, let's, wow. let's do it this way. We'll start off on top. We gotta, what do we know about them? George Washington, right? Okay. <coughs> Father of this country, wore false teeth, did not wear a wig. Yeah, what Never about lived him? in the... The only president not to live in the White House. Mm -hmm. Had Why no not? children of his own. Why didn't he live there? Hmm? Why didn't he live there? It wasn't built. Oh, there's, there's evidence that he entered it during construction, but he himself mm -hmm. never lived there. He died mm -hmm. just before it was ready for occupancy. Our capital was in New York. Mm -hmm. The original we federal city. Yeah, yeah, we didn't mm -hmm. have a capital then. And Washington, D.C. is land given from Maryland to be the capital. I'm not sure. That's what it is. No one called me. What? No one called me. I don't know. Well, yeah, it does. <laughs> oh. Come on, it was, now. it was originally called Washington City, too. Well, and then, then later on, they changed it to D.C. District of Columbia. But originally, it was Washington City. Mm -hmm. Move on to Adams. Well, well what else? Anybody else about Washington? What do you want to say? You know, okay. he he he, uh, uh, he chopped down the cherry tree. It's true. He did Alleged. do that. He did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is true. Okay. Uh, he could throw a silver dollar across the Potomac River. I don't know if you would have thrown a dollar, dollar Your dollar went a lot further in those days. So. I was, yeah, and that dollar was worth a lot more money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, the thing yeah. about, ma makes me think of a, there's a, a, a Chinese farmer here in the U.S. He, he, um, he tells his son all about George Washington and uh, the, cherry, the, the story of the cherry tree. He chopped down the cherry tree. He owned up to it, you know. Never tell a lie. You know, it will, you'll always be, you know, rewarded for it. So, a few days later, the son sees this old, outbuilding this outhouse that he can't stand and he pushes it and it falls down the hill he gets home father says son did you push that down the hill he says yes i did father so the <laughs> father wailed the tar out of him he says but father you said with george washington's father if he didn't tell a lie he, he, he would be okay why did you why did you uh, discipline me like that he says george washington's father not sitting in cherry tree
<laughs> that was John Ryan, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. John Ryan. Yeah. What else about George? Who's keeping down? score at home? He, he he started a lot of traditions, right? Uh, Mr. President, right? The, the being called Mr. President rather than what did you say earlier? Uh, he wanted to be um, John Adams wanted the president to be called His Royal Highness of the United States of the Republic of the United States of America, and Washington felt that too formal, and he suggested just plain Mr. President. However. On the formality side of it, George Washington did not like to shake hands. He felt shaking hands beneath the dignity of the presidency. He liked bowing instead. So, something's informal, something's formal. Anyone uh, else? Our, pre our, our, our present president likes to be bowed to also. <laughs> and he does thing. like to bow. Yeah. You know. right. And he likes to bow. Anybody else? Jeanette? No. I, I just said he must be the man that uh, did not tell a lie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, well, he was a planter, right? Yes, a Virginia and, planter. And uh, a slaveholder? Slave definitely a slaveholder, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In Virginia. Uh, what yeah. else? Owned uh, the biggest whiskey distillery in the country. Mm -hmm. He made a lot of his money. Actually, the Washington fortune was made not on crops. It was made on whiskey distilling. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, he's not the only one, though, right? Oh, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he owned the biggest whiskey distillery at that time did, in the did nation. He, did he own slaves? He certainly did. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. I think Most, of all of all the presidents up to who were slave owners, correct? Well, not all up to. Uh, the second one, John Adams, never owned slaves oh. and was very much opposed to it. Thomas Jefferson right. definitely had slaves. Madison had slaves. Monroe had slaves. John Quincy Adams, no. No. The northern, the uh, from Massachusetts. Andrew Jackson, right? no. Andrew Jackson would have been too poor. He had a very poor, humble right. upbringing, so he did not own slaves, you know. Um, the strange thing about it was, though, many of them even recognized it as not the right thing to do, and they actually put provisions in their wills to free their slaves mm -hmm. on their debts. So, mm -hmm. now yeah. here's one. Here's one for you, Ulysses S. Grant, who followed Lincoln, mm -hmm. uh, followed Andrew Johnson. Actually, he w wound up either getting or inheriting a farm plantation in Missouri, and free briefly held slaves, but he freed them right away. I don't know that. So we're skipping ahead, though, aren't we? Yeah. We're getting yeah. ahead of ourselves. I was going to say we jumped about. Uh, yeah, I know. Well, that's okay. About twenty-five presidents. I, I would have forgotten the game it by then. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay, John Adams. Up. John Adams, second president from. Massachusetts? 18, yeah, from, De from Braintree, Massachusetts, yeah. First president to occupy the White House in 1800, moved into the White House, only lived there for four months, uh, bitter enemies with Thomas Jefferson, and then later in life, the two became extremely good friends through correspondence and through letters. Um, Adams, oddly enough, I, I don't know why, he was a great president and a good president and everything, but Strange Life is not depicted on any U.S. currency. John Adams, nothing. Hmm. Not, not, a, not, not any coin or anything for John Adams, yeah. Strangely enough, yeah. Did um, let's see, who was his vice president? Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know who his vice president well, was. Nobody forgets the poor vice president. I don't know. <laughs> uh, the way they used to do it in the in the early days, presidential elections, uh, the president mm -hmm. ran, and whoever ran against him, whoever lost, became yeah. the vice president. Yeah. yeah, that's how they did it. Yeah, president in charge of yeah. vice. Mm -hmm. Third president, or do you want anybody else want to say anything on Adams? What well, Adams? Uh, no. Oh, one, one thing I noticed though, how many presidents are named after streets in downtown Chicago? Oh, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, not only in this city, in every city, presidents, uh, very popular presidents' names. In, and uh, and have a lot of whiskey and beers. <laughs> sure. After him too. sure. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Thomas Jefferson. Okay. Uh, $2 third, bill. Third, <laughs> third president on the $2 bill, definitely, yeah. A widower when he went into office. Was he? Oh. Yeah, widowed. His, his wife Martha died. He vowed he would never remarry after his wife died because they were so much in love. However, that did not stop him from having an extramarital affair with Sally Hemings, his black mistress. Uh, he actually had four illegitimate children with her, mm -hmm. who later went on not too all that many two years ago. All that many years ago, they had a big thing about yeah, them okay. trying to claim an direct ancestry to right. Thomas Jefferson yeah. and being part of the Monticello Society and all that. Um, a very extremely brilliant man, very well accomplished in many many things. Yeah, he was uh, uh, a real uh, like a, what they call a Renaissance, Renaissance man. man. Yeah, yeah author, of, author, lawyer, yeah. farmer, yeah, statesman. Right, you know, many I many things. I, I would have to say, contrary to public opinion, as our president. Our present president being the most uh, intelligent uh, mm -hmm. uh, president in history, oh, I, would, I would submit Jefferson as probably the most intelligent. Uh, now, it was in the uh, Jefferson administration that we had the Louisiana Purchase? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. He, he's the one that, uh, yeah, what he, uh, it was his idea to have Lewis and Clark take this expedition of exploration, and he would bring back, he wanted all kinds of samples, though, all kinds of uh, uh, trees, you know, the floor the and fauna. Louisiana the Purchase, uh, Tom, just to give you a little on the Louisiana Purchase, because it was a big deal. I'm glad you kind of brought that one up, because it was a big accomplishment of his administration. Um, 
Originally, he went and sent his minister, Robert Livingston, to France to negotiate for the purchase of the Port of New Orleans because Jefferson felt the control of the Mississippi would be extremely important to the United States for expansion and for trade of the Mississippi River. So the negotiations were kind of at a standstill and this and that, and things weren't going anywhere, and then Jefferson sent Monroe to be with him. So you had Monroe and Livingston negotiating for the purchase. And after some months of this going no place, the French foreign minister, Talleyrand, approached both of the gentlemen and said, well, why don't you just buy the whole Louisiana Territory? Why do you just want New Orleans? And they said, well, what would you ask for it? And he said, $15 million. And originally, Jefferson had negotiated to Congress for $3 million for the purchase of New Orleans. But he said, privately, if you have to go up to $10 million, go to the $10 million to get New Orleans. We really need that. Well, the 15 was a lot of money. It was actually more money than we had as a, as a government at that time. We didn't have the money. But they knew it was too good of a deal to pass up, so they actually borrowed the money from Dutch bankers and bought the Louisiana Territory before they even sent word to Jefferson that they bought it. And then when they came home and this was announced, critics said, look at how your government wastes your money. <laughs> they spent three cents an acre for wasteland, and this is costing $3 for each taxpayer in the United States at that time. <laughs> So, but it was the biggest real estate yeah. deal in history, and it doubled our doubled size. Yeah. Doubled our size. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. It takes so he knew what he was doing, but it was not a popular move amongst the public. Yeah. No, yeah, well, at the time, you know, people don't know. Yeah. Th that took in, well, not uh, Illinois was part of the Northwest Territory, they called it. It, it skirted around us. We yeah. were not part of the Louisiana Purchase. No, no. Yeah, we were still French territory, but it skirted around us. We were not part of the Louisiana Purchase. Well, by that time, we weren't. Fourteen states and parts of states came out of the Louisiana Purchase. Right. So it was a big chunk of, of property. We even have um, the... Uh, Jefferson, during his administration, of course, it came out about Sally Hemings and Dusky Sally, and they knew he had this black mistress and was carrying on this affair, and Jefferson just simply chose to ignore it, like it didn't exist, and said, it's my own business. And he yeah. kept it that way, and then eventually the press gave up on him. Right, uh, Thomas right. Jefferson also endured the pres the, installed the present-day front door on the White House, of which there are two keys to. What was that now? The, the front door on the White House that's still there actually survived the fire in 1814. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jefferson installed that door, and there are two keys to that front door. Okay, well, I, the fire I, know, I know Monica Lewinsky has one. <laughs> who, who, who is no, the Monica, Monica Lewinsky <laughs> has the key to the back door. <laughs> <laughs> now, the fire of 1840, wasn't that, was that torched by the uh, British? And the We're getting to that. That's going to be the next okay, one. That's okay. James Madison. Oh, is it? Yeah, James Madison's our next president. We just talked about Jefferson. Anybody else have any Jefferson facts? Oh, yeah, anything? I know one thing. Go ahead. Uh, he was a redhead. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Stan Laurel was a redhead whose real name was Arthur Stanley Jefferson. Could they have been related? Possibly. Both, both the movie, English, like, heritage, English heritage for he both could of be, them. He could be uh, Jefferson and Hardy could be uh, Adams. Mm -hmm. Adams, you know. Jefferson was one of our tallest presidents, too. We always think of Lincoln being very tall, which he was, but Jefferson was very tall. For the 18th century, Jefferson was extremely tall. For that matter, so was George Washington. George Washington touched six feet, which for the 18th century was extremely oh, yeah. tall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was big. James Madison, now we go to the short end of the stick, one of our shortest presidents, very diminutive, small man, barely touching five feet tall, married to a very, very popular mm. White House hostess and first lady, Dolly Madison. Uh, she towered above him, and to make matters even worse because of the fashions of the day, Dolly wore turbans with feathers in them and it made her even <laughs> appear taller, uh, and very, very different from the president. Dolly was very outspoken, she smoked in public, she used rouge, she dipped tobacco, she did all these things. She was an extremely popular White House hostess, and. Uh, Madison, on the other hand, was very, very quiet and very subdued and a very well-respected man, but very, very quiet. So the two were an odd match. Mm. Uh, childless couple. They never mm. had children. And Madison was what? The father of the Constitution? The father said? of the U.S. Constitution. Mm -hmm. He was very instrumental in getting the Constitution mm -hmm. written and, and pushed through. And the Madisons had the misfortune. They loved the White House, and Dolly actually planted the Rose Garden there. And they loved the White House and had the misfortune of being in when we were attacked by the British and the White House was burnt. And, of course, we all know the famous story, Dolly saved... Uh, the famous George Washington portrait, which he had taken out and rolled up and, and carted away before the British came to burn the house down. Mm -hmm. They had a fire sale, huh? They had a fire sale, yeah. <laughs> Not too much existed of the original White House except the outside walls, which are still there. Any other observations, Jeanette? No, I, he has brought up the word White House, uh, and I'll just bring something up to date. I had the pleasure of going through the White House in uh, being a tourist, and... Uh, uh, it it definitely has a, a historical uh, you know feeling and and my goodness who walked through these halls and who did this and who did that, but it's a very dilapidated uh, old building. It's just very ancient inside. Yeah. Uh, it's like our Springfield, like our governor's possibly. mansion. It's fallen apart. Uh -huh. Well, the yeah. point is, I'm not there to say a negative thing no. as much as. I was very surprised to 
mm-hmm. to see how um, how good it's taken care of as to cleanliness and all the things that are very wonderful and gorgeous about their uh, all those collections. That, yeah. But it's a very old, old building. Well, that, that'd be that'd be a good uh, campaign point for uh, uh, for Donald Trump because yeah, he builds well, he, he builds such beautiful buildings. Yeah. If I am he elected, never if I am elected, too. I will completely re- refurbish the White House. Well, that, well, through the years, there were actually plans yeah, over the years of actually yeah. demolishing the White House. Um, there were pl- you're not the only one that feels that it's a very old oh, and dilapidated yeah. building because uh, through the now of course uh, right in 1814, not too long after it was built, it was built in 1800 and ready for occupancy. Uh, in 1814, then of course it was burnt. Outside shell walls still stood, and then, of course, it was rebuilt again from the inside out and then used, and um, through the years, it had its problems. Um, The building was done kind of in haste, and um, it wasn't set on a real good foundation, so the building creaked and settled funny and things like that, and all this would become very apparent during later administrations. And about the time of... um, Oh, at about the time of Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt did some major, major remodeling to the White House and cut into some support pieces and did some things to make passage easier and eliminated one of the staircases and stuff. And then later on, during the Truman administration, they found this actually was leading to the building's collapse. At the time Harry Truman was president, yeah, the building was about ready to fall in. And it's fortunate for us that Harry Truman was president when he was because he was very instrumental in getting them to keep the White House. They were actually going to demolish it and build a new one. And he mm. says, no, if we do that, we lose our history. So they kept, uh, there again, they kept the outside walls, fireplace mantles, woodwork, doors, everything was marked, mm-hmm. everything was put back in to keep it as original as possible. Mm-hmm. But the whole s- structure was rebuilt with a steel underpinning and basements and sub-basements and, you know, modern air conditioning and heating system and all that. So... But it does get a lot of use. Does anyone, yes. uh, is yes. anyone else been to the tour? Have you ever toured, Bob? I never toured the White House. No, I Tom? Yeah, I've, I've been there. And you go every year to the police memorial. I was wondering. Right. And w- one of the years, uh, I had a uh, private behind-the-scenes tour. We were able to go down into the bunker and no. right into the Oval Office. Actually, you don't walk into the Oval Office, no. but you can stand right at the opening. And y- mm-hmm. You might step on somebody or something. Right. <laughs> now, during the administration of Chester Arthur, Chester Allen Arthur, of course, became president on the death of James Garfield. Uh, James Garfield was assassinated, shot, and died, and then Gar- Arthur became president. And he did a walkthrough on the White House and says, I'm not living in this place. It's just too run down. It's run like a second-rate hotel, and you can forget this. So he brings in none other than Louis Comfort Tiffany to come in. It's the first time in history that a professional decorator and designer was brought in to redecorate the White House. And what he did is he actually went through the White House and the storerooms and everything and got rid of like 24 carloads of historic furnishings and stuff and said, nope, this is all going. And he had a big uh, garage sale, White House garage sale. Uh, if you watch the Antiques Roadshow, every now and again from time to time, some White House China fine. that was actually bought at this sale pops up on, on TV mm-hmm. and that, you know, so. Mm-hmm. And he just got rid of a lot of the stuff and he had a complete redecoration done of the White House and that. And one of the things from this redecoration of 1882 was a huge Tiffany lead glass screen in the front hall of the White House which was actually there to, not so much for beauty, but it was actually put there to cut down on drafts in the house. These are in the days before central heat. And um, during the administration of Theodore Roosevelt, when he did his major remodeling, he had this screen, this glass taken out, and not one piece of it ever exists. Mm. No one knows whatever happened to it. They think it was sold off to some hotel or something for $200, uh, but there's not enough. Can you imagine what this thing would be worth today? It was Tiffany glass, Mm. and the screen was huge. And not, not a piece of this glass exists. Today. Yeah, not a piece of it mm-hmm. exists. Yeah. Now, Bill, with your involvement with the labor and the firefighters or whatever, I was were you ever in as, Washington? as Tom. Oh yeah, as Tom. Uh, you know, I I go to the uh, you tour the the tour, and we had uh, Terry Gaynor took us through the White House, and and uh, was he the, took the chief us all of uh, about, yeah uh, and, White House and and police? as as Tom said, we went through the whole thing, uh, and these were. Uh, Survivors, police survivors, uh, the cops program, and uh, uh, it right, was t- Terry Gaynor was, was a, a uh, Chicago police officer. Mm-hmm. Then he was uh, with Washington D.C. Police, then head of the Capitol Police, and he retired as uh, Sergeant at Arms of the uh, U.S. Senate. Exactly, and he's he's doing uh, uh, some private work now, and uh, a, a good guy, good guy. <laughs> he was the uh, God bless you. Thank you. He was the uh, director of the Illinois State Police when my kid was that's right, uh, that's right. was on yes, there. Yeah, was that that was the period? Huh? Uh, yeah, and and and, and, and we went through there. Uh, well, it was eighty two, eighty two, 
and uh, we we really got uh, to look at this and and uh, uh, being a fire inspector and and uh, a builder and that uh, going through there yeah I could see all of the things that are, were wrong and the same as our uh, our uh, governor's mansion here in mm -hmm. Springfield mm -hmm. uh, you know it's uh, uh, it, it should be torn down right so I uh, excuse me Go I ahead. just want to say I think a word that would give you an insight to the inside is uh, when they say a maze that just seemed to you know I, I probably had a very uh, uh, glamorous uh, theory of what I was you know wow and, and yet I will say if I went to an individual room that room was elegant you know, and in, in, in its but it is a maze is way. what you yeah yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I was uh, I wasn't disappointed, yeah. but I was shocked a little bit at its it's not like you see on TV aging yeah yeah no you know you know it isn't like the it fifth president James Monroe anybody kay. have anything to say about him besides um, the Monroe Doctrine yeah uh, probably the street greatest after uh, Madison Street huh? Well, that's Monroe. <laughs> Monroe Doctrine. Monroe was, uh, Doctrine. It was out. There was a uh, declaration that no European power should be uh, further extending their influence in the new in new in hemisphere. The northern, northern, yeah. It was uh, briefly violated uh, during our civil war by France in Mexico when they installed uh, uh, Maximilian, and he didn't last too long there. As a matter of fact, Monroe the, uh, was actually a very popular president, very well liked. Um, a lot of people felt he resembled George Washington. They liked him, although he did come under criticism for buying French furnishings to furnish the blue room in the east room of the White House. Mm -hmm. They felt the furnishings should have been American made. Well, you know, well, even then, buy American in those yes. days, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In, now, in those days, France was still such a big influence. Oh, and a very big ally of the U.S., yeah. The whole, the whole, uh, uh, this whole part of the country, Canada, mm -hmm. you know, Mexico, the, one of, yeah. one of the islands. Uh, if, you know. if it was possible for yeah. George Washington to do, to do anything unpopular, which everything he did was loved by the public, the one unpopular thing he did do was not back up Louis the Fourteenth and Marie Antoinette. He did not back, back up the French monarchy. And many people felt we should have assisted them. And he says, no, we ourselves fought against a mm -hmm. monarchy for a republic and for a democracy, and we need mm -hmm. to stay out of the affairs of Europe. Louis the 16th, wasn't and, and, Yeah, Louis the 16th. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, I said the 14th. The yeah, 14th yeah. was actually the Sun King, who Louisiana is named for. Yeah. I yeah. got my Louis wrong. There were so many of mm -hmm. them. And anyway, that was one of the most unpopular things he did, because many people felt he should have backed the monarchy, and Je mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson included. Jefferson was a very big... Critic, critical of Washington for that yeah. decision, but yeah. he stuck to it. Yeah, if, and maybe if George had forced, you know, I could see in the future what a terrible, bloody thing this uh, French Revolution was. It wasn't. Well, just many people felt because France had helped us, the monarchy had helped us during the war mm -hmm. against Britain, and they felt we should repay the favor. But he stuck to his policy and said, "No, stay out of the affairs of Europe." Well, he was probably right in that sense, but you know, John Quincy Adams. Anything to say about John Quincy Adams? Uh, it was one-term president, right? Single-term president, well, son of John Adams, the second yeah. president. Son. We have Quincy Street <laughs> between, he actually liked, he actually between liked Adams and swim. Jackson in mm -hmm. Chicago. He actually liked to go and swim, take his clothes off, and swim across the Potomac River and back again to the White House. Yeah. First president to wear long pants. He was probably looking for the dollars that George used to yeah, throw over. Yeah. <laughs> and he was the first president to be photographed. He was actually photographed really? in a very old daguerreotype uh, in the photography nude? system. Swimming? Not in the nude. No, oh, okay. no. No, not in the nude. <laughs> so he had his things. He actually died in the House of Representatives when he was uh, much he, later He returned life. to the House. He, he, was, he yeah. went to the House. He was giving a speech, and he died there. And somebody on the Antiques Roadshow brought in the chair that supposedly he was sitting in, mm -hmm. in the House of Representatives. He died right he in the House? Yeah. Yeah, he died oh, right there. He had, a, he had a stroke. That's right died. on the job, during huh? During his speech. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, during his speech. Now, uh, so it was one term. Didn't he also, though, that, that movie that was out there about this story about the slave ship, Amistad, <laughs> Mm -hmm. John Quincy. He was the now that's, now that's when he was already out of office. He was retired yeah, from, I know, from, I know. from the presidency. Right. And he was a very big advocate against slave yeah. holding well, he, as he his was father was. him as a lawyer, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was interesting. Another still. unpopular decision, too. Now that was another movie by, uh, what's his name, too, right? Was the director? Yeah. What's Andrew the director's Jack name I'm thinking of? Ang Lee? No, 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 no. Lee Ang? Jaws and... Uh, Steven Spielberg. Yeah, Spielberg. What do you think of his name? You know, if you realize what we newsworthy get now, I mean, it's instant. Oh yeah. And back in those days, you know, weeks. Do you? Do you? Well, yeah, weeks. weeks. Uh, uh, and and it had to be by 
Pony Express mm -hmm. and, and right. uh, sure. you know, these guys weren't going to go around and mm -hmm. You know, talking. You you just wonder: Did the windows? people really yeah. know what the hell they're getting sure, into, sure. Right. and who well, they're who or they're? Or it's been done for. before we we got the news, the but uh, it already happened. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, the Battle of New Orleans happened. The, the treaty was already signed. You know, in yeah. 1814, we took a little trip. That was already over by then. Okay, Probably we're getting we. to him. That's Andrew Jackson. That's oh, wait, the next wait, president. Hold Andrew, will you? Yeah, I think we're on, are we? John, John? No, no. We're oh, oh, we're. Uh, it looks like another uh, time for a brief intermission. You're listening to Meet the Chicago Historians. Hey, friends. Do you need an awning over your front, side, or rear door? Or your windows? How about a canopy for your carport? Or a patio cover over your patio so you can enjoy being outside in case of rain in the warm weather? All you have to do is call Awnings and More, and Raphael Bogus will drive over, measure up whatever you need, and go from there. You can call Awnings and More at 773-710-8403 or 847-890-1447. So if you need an awning for your windows or doors, call Raphael Bogus at Awnings and More at 773-710-8403 or 847-890-1447. Raphael also installs hand railings for your front, side, or back steps. You must be safe when you go up and down the steps, especially in bad weather. So for awnings or handrails, call Raphael Bogus at 773-710-8403 or 847-890-1447. Call today for a free estimate. And now back to Meet the Chicago Historians. Jack? Okay, okay, this brought us back to... Who was it, Andrew Jackson? Ron time? Andrew Jackson. Yeah, now he well, followed who? He followed John Quincy Adams. That okay. was our seventh president. Wow. Uh, Andrew Jackson was the first president of the people. He was not a Virginia aristocrat or a wealthy Adams attorney. Uh, he was a poor man. He worked himself up from nothing, and he was the first president to actually open up the White House and have a reception there for the public, which turned out to be a huge mistake because the <laughs> public rushed the White House and almost destroyed it, destroyed all the furnishings and carpeting and everything in it. And the only way they got the rowdy crowd out was to put a big cheese and, and tubs of punch out onto the lawn to get the people out of the White House. Um, he also came under criticism for his wife, Rachel, who he very much loved, and they said he married her bigamously. Her divorce was not final, and he actually married her, so he kind of felt like the public um, scrutiny he got for that killed his wife. Mm -hmm. um, he's the president on the $20 bill. We talked about that a little yep. earlier. And I can't see any reason to take him off. You no, I don't either, yeah. I yeah. thought there was Charlton Heston. <laughs> I think he Could played him two or three times in the movie. So. Yeah, and we should mention that, too, was the hero of the Battle of New Orleans, and mm -hmm. we brought that up. That actually yeah. was the hero of the war. Two, he fought the Battle of New Orleans two weeks after the war actually ended. <laughs> but the news in those days traveled a little mm -hmm. slowly, so <laughs> you didn't get the news on time. Mm -hmm. Was he a two-term president? I don't remember. He got elected two terms. He was very popular. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah he got he elected twice. He was a very twice. popular guy. Yeah. did a lot. But he left the White House broke, as a lot of our yeah. presidents did. He left, the, he left the White House with hardly no money at all mm -hmm. and was supported through charities and through the public. Yeah, he didn't people. ransack it and take things like some mm -hmm. administration did, did he? Well, recently? in the past you were able to do that, not so much no. anymore. No. Um, actually, this next gentleman, we're going to talk about Martin Van Buren, not too much known about him as president. Mm -hmm. um, he was actually the first president born an American citizen. Mm. Mm -hmm. How is this possible? You have to be an American citizen yeah. to be president. The first seven were born British subjects before independence. Mm -hmm. He was the first president actually born an American mm -hmm. citizen. Okay, okay now, he was he the first of non-English? Uh, he was English. 
He was Denver. English, but he was born. He was American born. Well, that Dutch in New York. Right? He, was not, he was not a I, subject. I think, I think didn't Jackson put that in when he was writing part of the Constitution? Constitution. Yeah, it was in the Constitution uh, with Jefferson. Madison. I think Madison. that was yeah. Jackson that yeah. did that. Yeah. Um, Martin Van Buren had the misfortune of being president during one of our country's first economic depressions, uh, and he was somewhat of a dandy himself, and he liked fine things and nice things, so he spent some money on the White House having some things redone, which he came under strong criticism for, and also for the gold uh, and silver service for the White House, which he had nothing to do with. That was actually there before he got there, but he came under criticism for that. Um, he had a very, very beautiful daughter who served as White House hostess, who was very popular, but he himself as president, not so popular. One term or two? Served one term. One Served term. one term and got out of there, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, next president, William Henry Harrison. We have nothing much to say about him, and his biggest accomplishment was that he was the president that served the shortest, shortest term. He served 30 days in office. Mm -hmm. Insisted on making his do inaugural out in the rain? What is that what it was? That's exactly it. He made a three-and-a-half-hour yes. inaugural speech yeah, in the rain. He caught pneumonia, and he died. Mm -hmm. His wife would have been the oldest first lady at 64 years of age, mm -hmm. and she never even served in capacity even for the 30 okay. days because her husband was in the White House, and she was still back home. She never even got time to travel to Washington to assume her, her duties as first lady. She, he just, it was just that fast. It went... How old was he when he died? I don't know. He was he was a little older, too, in his late 60s, I think, like 68 or 69 when he died from pneumonia. His ghost mm. is said to haunt the White House attic. Mm. I can tell you this from doing paranormal radio, because the White House is a very haunted location. We won't hey, get into that. That's how all this the show. Be, how would this be for a title? During the reign of William Henry, Henry Harrison, the reign. Yeah, it was a very it's short a reign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hominem. Next president, John Tyler, our ninth president. He actually had to fight for the presidency. He said, by the right of secession on the, on the death of William Henry Harrison, I am the president. And he oh, was the not, first time that came up, right? And he was not a popular president or not a popular vice president, and he had to fight for it. They actually wanted to hold an election, and he stuck to his guns. And constitutionally, he says, no, you don't. It's mine. Yeah, I've got it. He actually had the largest family of any, uh, any president. He had 14 children from two marriages. Hmm. Uh, and interesting about him is he proposed marriage. His first wife died. He had seven children. He had eight children with the second Mrs. Tyler, who was about 24 years his junior, and he actually proposed to her in the blue room of the White House. Mm -hmm. And a strange little fact about this is Mary Todd Lincoln claimed to see the ghost of John Tyler kneeling towards one of the settees in the blue room, and she said she felt that was him bowing down and proposing to his second wife for a marriage proposal. But the trouble with this story was John Tyler wasn't dead yet. <laughs> John Tyler. Yeah. John Tyler actually has two grandsons still alive. If you can believe this, they are in their 80s and they are two grandsons. Now you say how is this possible? Mm -hmm. His daughter, Pearl Tyler Ellis, John Tyler was born in the 18th century when George Washington was president. He was born in 1799. He lived until the Civil War years. He remained a staunch Confederate. He never supported the Union. Mm -hmm. Um he he loved the Confederacy and supported that and, su and supported right. Southern rights. However, in 1860, when he was 70 years of age, he gave birth to a daughter, Pearl Tyler Ellis, who lived until the middle of the 21st century. She lived till 1947. So her father was born in the 18th century. You skip over mm. to 19th century, and he's got a daughter that died in the 21st century and had two sons, which are his grandsons, that are still alive today. She, wow. she, she died what year? Yep. She died in, the, in, in 1947. 20th century. P Pearl Tyler Ellis. Yeah. yeah, that was her name. Hmm. Yeah. Now, though, he was also... There was a Tyler Street in Chicago, I understand. They changed it to Congress later because of his support of the Confederacy. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, he remained a staunch supporter of the Confederacy. Even though he was president of the Union, he yeah. lived into the Civil War, and then he mm -hmm. died shortly thereafter. But he remained a supporter of the Confederacy. I was having an argument with someone about that. You know, there, there's no Tyler Street. Sure he is. He went to a lot of Italian food there on Tyler Street. Zachary Taylor. <laughs> Zachary Taylor, not too much to be said about him. Um, mm -hmm. A war hero, I think a, a war hero from the Mexican War. Um, kind of a do-nothing president. He had very few duties to do in the White House. Uh, his war horse that he had brought with him to Washington grazed the White House lawns. Um, Zachary Taylor's wife, I forget what her first name is, Taylor, Mrs. Taylor, is the only first lady that we have no picture of. Oh, and, uh, now, going back to um, John Tyler, mm -hmm. I just have to mention, I saw a portrait of him. He looked just like Victor Jory. It's yeah. true, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just like him. Spit yeah. image. Mm hmm yeah. So anyway. Not so, so not too much to be said about Zachary Taylor. They actually think he may have been our first assassinated president, but a few years ago they proved that wrong. They actually got permission from the family to exhume his, his body, his tomb. They think he was arsenic poisoned. It turned out it was not so. Okay. So he was not assassinated. He died from natural causes. In, in the White House? He died in the White House. And then presidency. he was succeeded by? 
It was succeeded by James Knox Polk. That wasn't too long ago, was it? Uh, that they. Uh, a couple years back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A couple years back, they did it. They because arsenic actually stays. They say it stays in your nails and in yes. your hair and, fr and bone mm -hmm. fragments and stuff. Mm -hmm. So they actually mm -hmm. zoomed his body, did some testing on it, and he says no, it wasn't true. Uh, what he did is on the fourth of July, he was giving a speech out in the heat. It was extremely hot that year in Washington, and he was giving a speech out in Washington. And so for refreshments, they had buttermilk and they had cherries, and he was eating that to kind of refresh himself. And they think the milk was not pasteurized. Something was wrong with the milk, and it caused a stomach ulcer, and he died from mm. that. So that was the end of him. Uh, the man who succeeded him, James Knox Polk, um, became a very, very popular president, a very, very hard-working president. He worked himself actually to death. Was um, he from Tennessee? Yeah, he and his Knoxville he, and all that. Yeah. yeah, James Knox Polk. Oh. Yeah, he was a Tennessean. Yeah, and actually, him and his wife actually worked side by side together. A childless couple. They had no children. Uh, Polk actually had gaslighting installed in the White House so he could work longer into the evening hours. Uh, gaslighting was a lot better and more efficient than candle lighting. Uh, his wife did not totally trust it, and at one of the White House receptions they were holding in the Blue Room, she actually had them bring in candle hoppers. She said, in case something happens, I want some light in the White House, and she was right. The gas system failed, they lit the candles, and the reception went on. Hmm. Um, Polk actually worked very, very hard and would work late into the hours, handwriting bills and doing things he needed to do, uh, very, very much on, uh, concerned with Western expansion and expansion into Texas and, and that kind of stuff, uh, very concerned about that. Also, the slavery issue was starting now to come up with, but that was something he didn't need to address just now what yet. year was this about now this would have been the 18 Still late, prior, late 40s prior to the civil 30s, war yeah yeah, yeah okay. mm, right around there um franklin pierce anybody have anything to say on james knox polk nothing on him next gentleman franklin pierce not a whole lot to say about franklin pierce either probably one of the saddest presidency um en route to washington on his election uh he and his wife the first lady were involved in a train wreck which killed their son. Actually, their son was decapitated. Uh, and he took his cloak off and covered his son's body so his wife wouldn't see it. And it kind of put a damper on the presidency. His wife remained closeted on the second floor of the White House uh, for mourning. And those days, mourning went on for a very long time. Uh, she would hold no White House receptions. Um, the presidency actually drove him to drink, and he actually died when he left office an alcoholic, Franklin Pierce. He was in, 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 in office? Yeah. He, d he died when he left office. He died from alcoholism. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Millard Fillmore. <laughs> sort of a do-nothing president. Not much to say about Millard Fillmore. Not much to say about him all, except he did start the White House Library. His wife actually did start the White House Library. And he actually had a stove installed in the White House, uh, in the White House kitchens. Up until that time, all the cooking was done over open fires in the fireplaces, as it had mm -hmm. done, been done for many years before since the White House was built. And he actually had a cast iron stove with dampers and things installed in the kitchen. And no one knew how to work it. And the president had to take a carriage ride over to the patent's office to get someone to come out and show them how to work the stove. Hmm. Yeah. Couldn't he tell him on the phone? <laughs> the phone didn't come in until the 1870s on the yeah. Rutherford behavior. I know, I was getting ahead of ourselves. Well, couldn't, couldn't he have just Googled it? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Email. A century later, he could have. Exactly Text. Uh, that was our 14th guy. Now we're coming to James Buchanan. There again, not a whole lot the same about Buchanan. He preceded Lincoln, was our only bachelor president. Uh, he himself, not too much of a popular president. And again, the question came up of abandoning the White House. Uh, he felt it too swampy, too malaria-ridden, too uncomfortable during the summer months. Uh, he wanted he he predicted that it eventually would not be used as a residence, but just maybe office space and the in the presidential residence being moved somewhere else. Um, he was a bachelor, so his na niece Harriet Lane served as White House hostess during receptions and functions, and she was extremely, extremely popular. Who's that? Um, his his niece Harriet Lane served as his hostess because he had no wife. He was a bachelor. Mm -hmm. And during his administration, just about the only thing he did to do any refurnishing in the White House was bought a suite of uh, gilded furniture for the Blue Room. And that was about it. Now, he was, um, I remember one quote from him was uh, when hostilities broke out, I'm the last president of the United States, he said. Yeah. He thought he would he be, very, you know. He very severely thought there was going to be a separation yeah. between North and South. And he, he went on congratulating Lincoln on winning the election. He says, if you're as happy coming into the White House as I am leaving, you're a very happy man. He was just all too happy to leave the presidency and leave the Civil War to Lincoln. Wasn't his cup of tea. Not his thing. No. Mm -mm. Abraham Lincoln, that's our next one. Do we need to say anything more about Lincoln? Well, we know an awful I'll lot leave about it, I'll, I'll leave it up to you guys. Go ahead. Here's a guy that uh, he was suffered every humiliation while he was in the uh, office as far as... Uh, Name calling and cartooning and yeah. right, oh, oh extreme. Yeah, uh -huh, yeah. Want to say something? No, no. You go ahead. I'm, uh, in a general way, he's noted, you know, for for so much, and we we uh, uh, you know admire him and everything. But he was also a very insecure man. Mm -hmm. Very. He and thought, thought he was thought very depression ugly. All his life too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, depression was a big thing. Yeah. Was he, he was self-taught, right? Became a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Uh 
when, like you said about him considering himself ugly and homely, a famous Lincoln quote was when he was accused of being two-faced. He mm -hmm. said, "If I had two faces, would I be using this one?" Yeah, yeah. he, yeah. he yeah. also. It was a you know a bah. dominant bah. thing in his life. He and Mary Todd Lincoln, for that matter, when you look at their pictures, are really not too handsome a couple. Mary Todd, when she was in younger days, was not too bad looking, and of course she was a belle, southern belle of Kentucky. But uh, Lincoln and Mary Todd in later years were not too handsome, but their children, oddly enough, the sons they had, turned out to be not too bad looking. Bo no. Bob Newhart did a routine about Lincoln's, uh, his, like his uh, handler or whatever, campaign manager, talking to him on the phone. He goes like, no, Abe, first you're a real splitter and then you're a lawyer. <laughs> and he said, what when somebody says something about uh, Grant being a big drinker? You say, well, you just tell him, I want to find out what he drinks and send, send the case to everyone of my generals. You know? Lincoln and it was had, um, probably like you talk about FDR being a great president and during the war years and everything, Lincoln had an extremely, extremely tough presidency. Well, don't you I think, think of, I think of any president, he had it the worst. Yeah, he dealt with a lot of personal problems, the death of a son in the mm -hmm. White House. Mm -hmm. He dealt with his wife's depression and insanity and her problems. Mm -hmm. He had this war to deal with, a slavery issue, which no other president had to deal with. All this fell on Lincoln's lap, and he mm -hmm. dealt with it all as best he was able to do, but it showed. Well, he also was like a guy of great humor. He was like a oh, yeah. humor yeah. Uh, storyteller. Dry, and yeah. mm -hmm. Dry humor. He loved Good. going to the theater. He Good loved day. Shakespeare. He loved Shakespeare, he loved the opera, and he loved the theater. Mm -hmm. uh, that may have been his downfall, going to the theater and becoming yeah. assassinated. Um, he felt very, very disheartened at Mary Todd's behavior in her overspending. Uh, Congress had given them $7,000 on their um, election for refurbishing the mansion. And Mary Todd overspent this by about $25,000. Mm -hmm. She spent about $10,000 mm -hmm. for carpet in the East Room alone. And when he found out about this, he was just totally distraught. He said, I've got to go to Congress now to petition for money to pay these bills for flubadubs for this damned mansion, and I can't buy blankets and horses for the soldiers. So he was extremely, extremely upset with his wife's spending, but this was part of her strange behavior that she had. Very know, compulsive. Yeah, extremely, yeah. yeah. During the war, I know he carried a picture of one of the prisoners from the Libby Museum, uh, Lib Libby Prison in Virginia, one of the Union uh, who was like a total skeleton. And when they talked about harsh treatment of the southern prisoners, he would show them this picture of the northern who was like virtually starved to death, still alive, you know. But uh, He pardoned many, many soldiers, many soldiers for divers desertion and for cowardice and this and that and the other. And he says, I, I just don't want to be responsible for one more mm -hmm. death. I mean, the so Union he soldiers? Sign, so he would sign yeah, yeah. pardons for well, many, many soldiers. You know, the, well, plus yeah. the, the whole controversy surrounding his assassination, I read the book by uh, O'Reilly uh, about uh, Lincoln's assassination. Very, very interesting. Uh, and, I mean, to this day, there are people that... Uh, you know, to still discuss it and p points that are uh, Debated, huh? w one of the most interesting things that the the person that was this was pre Secret Service and actually probably was a, his assassination was uh, the start of the uh, uh, presidential uh, bodyguard detail, but the person that was assigned to him that night to supposedly protect him was in the uh, if you've ever been to uh, Washington D.C. and gone to Ford's Theater. But at the time, there was a tavern next door, and the guy that was assigned to protect Lincoln, this is one of the parts of the, you know, the controversy surrounding it, he was next door in the tavern getting drunk when, <laughs> when the president was assassinated. Yeah, yeah he, was, he was one of the Pinkerton agents assigned to him, and that's absolutely right. Um, another big thing, the downfall for his uh, uh, assassination was John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth was a very beloved celebrity in Washington. Um, he was like a matinee idol, and his calling card got him into anywhere in Washington, right. D.C. So it, was, it would not be unusual for him to sneak in and out of the Ford's Theater at right. any time. So when they saw him come through the front door, oh, you know, the presidents are no There's big deal. Uh, you know, no, no one thought anything of it. Yeah. That's, that's quite a place uh, uh, to go to and see and mm -hmm. go across the street Are and see where yeah. they took him. And, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, one of the things Ford's in Ford's his Ford. pocket, you mentioned yeah. that photograph. One of the things in his pocket when they went through his clothes and everything after his death was that photograph. Mm -hmm. He had a Confederate $5 bill, mm -hmm. a pocket knife, a pair of white gloves, which Mary Todd always forced him to wear and he never liked. He would stick them off and stick, stuff them in his mm -hmm. pockets, <laughs> and um, a handkerchief. Now, the, the, rather than talking about his physical appearance, tall and gangly, he went the opposite way. He did that, st wore that stovepipe hat that made him even taller. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it it actually yeah. added to his lanky appearance and that. And his, he, um, of course, elected 1860 and served till 1865 on his death. When you see photos of him in 1860, he entered that office a young man. When he left at age he 57, he aged 40 Easily. years. 
Unbelievable yeah. how he aged with the responsibilities wow. that had office. Just unbelievable. It's like being a, a, yeah. a, a, a coach of a team or something. Okay, Andrew Johnson, the man who succeeded him on his death. Anything to say about Andrew Johnson? He was a, a, a runaway indentured servant, I believe. He actually was. He was a tailor yeah. from Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Served as a tailor. Uh, came into the White House not too well liked at all. Right, not liked at all. According to referring again to O'Reilly's book, uh, he, he really brings that out that uh, Johnson was not a very popular mm -mm, person. Not at all. I uh, don't think anybody would be after Lincoln. Yeah, and, uh, you know. After after Lincoln's death, uh, the White House was ransacked. Hard act to follow, right? Yeah, they ransacked the White House. They would go in and they would take souvenirs. You kind of the White House, like we said, had lax security on it. Mm -hmm. And after Lincoln's funeral, they went in and of course they sold all the floral decorations out of the East Room. They cut pieces out of the carpets snipped off the curtains. Mm -hmm. uh, the servants did not like Mary Todd. They broke all her china. And when poor Andrew Johnson came in, they gave him absolutely no budget for redecoration at all. And about all his wife and daughter could do was paint and whitewash the kitchen and clean <laughs> some of the carpets in some of the family quarters. And that was about it. So the White House was pretty run down. Uh, he missed impeachment by one vote. That's how mm -hmm. unpopular he was. They wanted him out of there. Now he also, uh, he was on the ticket because Lincoln wanted to unite the country. He had a uh, mm -hmm. Someone who was from Tennessee, a rebel. He didn't. He never. He never. Uh, he didn't secede. He was he had no sympathy with the South. So he wanted someone from a reb state. He was a Democrat too. So both, they call both, it the Union Party or something. Both, they call both it. presidential assassinations. Lincoln's assassination and Kennedy's assassination. Both were seceded by men named Johnson. Both men's yeah. mothers, Andrew Johnson's mother and Lyndon Baines Johnson's mother, were both named Hannah. Johnson was born in 1808. Lyndon Johnson was born in 1908. Hmm. Talk about your similarities. Mm -hmm. So not too much to say about Johnson. A very unhappy presidency there. The that, next that, and Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson, yeah. yeah, yeah. Next man that comes in, Ulysses S. Grant. Gosh. Okay, before we get to Grant, uh, mm -hmm. there was a, a biopic about uh, Andrew Johnson with Van Heflin in the park. You ever seen that? Mm -hmm. I don't know about the accuracy of it, but it was, uh, of course, it was sympathetic toward him. You ever yeah. seen that movie, Bill? No. He no, was no. really to be feel sorry for. I mean, he had no choice in the matter. He, no. he seceded Lincoln. by vice, He was a vice president. He came into the office. He did the best he could. He tried sticking to Lincoln's policies. That was something that made him very unpopular because Lincoln mm -hmm. could get away with it, but not Johnson. They wanted him to punish the South, punish right, all the right. Southern leaders, and he didn't want to do yeah, that. Lincoln, he wanted to stick to Lincoln's policy uh, of, you know, charity was, and malice towards all, you know. He was viewed as the best friend the South would have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Act like it never happened. You're back, you know. Yeah. Whereas there were these radical Republicans, uh, they wanted to, well, do what they did, you know, reconst reconstruction. Sure, they wanted to punish him. Yeah, Lincoln didn't want heavy, it. And Johnson and, uh, was trying to stick to that policy, you yeah. know. Right. Okay, we skipped Andrew Johnson there. We talked about him. Ulysses S. Grant, gosh, very popular, popular, extremely popular president. Hero of the Civil War, mm -hmm. uh, elected unanimously. He ran his cabinet the way he ran the military. Uh, he put his military aides in cabinet positions, which turned out to be a big mistake for him because he had a very, very corrupt administration, mm -hmm. although he himself was on the up, yeah. uh, up and up and on the straight lace and everything like that. Uh, Julia Grant, his wife, an extremely popular first lady, she cried on leaving the White House. She loved it so much. The Grants were given a huge amount of money because they were so beloved to refurbish and redecorate the White House, which they did. They spent the money lavishly to do that. Their daughter Nellie had their wedding and the completed and refurnished White House with new chandeliers, new carpeting, new lace curtains. Um, their tastes were a little bit desired. Um, people looked at what they had done and they called it Steamboat Palace Decor. <laughs> they said they decorated the White House like a 19th century steamboat, but they thought it was in good taste and they loved it. And um, a very popular president with the people, although very, very unpopular and very corrupt administration and advisors and people around him. Yeah, and, now this and, was the first, uh, and the first president from Illinois. Well, because well, well, Lincoln not was actually from, from Illinois. Yeah, Kentucky. Lincoln was, yeah. I mean, he, yeah. he's, he's, yeah. he's he's known as being from Illinois, yeah. but technically yeah. Kentucky. The uh, um, uh, he was like me; he was a clothes horse, you know. Yeah. Now another, uh, he was also another president that left the White House in financial <laughs> dire need. Um, the presidential salary in those days barely exceeded the expenses of the office. I think it was maybe $25,000 a year. So when he left office, he had very, very little money. And, of course, he was not from any wealth or anything like that. And um, he was dying from cancer. And on his, uh, before he died, he actually had Mark Twain famous author, helped him with his autobiography, and he was going to leave this as a legacy to his family, and he finished the book, died, and the book went on to become a bestseller. Now, and was he one or two term? Oh, two term. You know, two term? So he served two term, yeah. Was has actually, anyone ever been to Galena? Trying, was actually seen trying for a third, but didn't make it, yeah. You ever seen his home in Galena? No. Yeah, yeah I've, I've been there. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. another interesting fact about uh, Grant, uh, General, uh, Civil War General from Galena, I think there's like eight or nine other generals, Civil War generals, that came from Galena, and I, I, for the life of me, I couldn't name one other. 
Yeah. Yeah. A very good general, a very good military and General general Mills. It took, it took Lincoln a long time. Lincoln ran through the ranks before he actually chose Grant. He went through a, a series of bad generals <laughs> before he got to Grant. And a lot of people didn't like Grant during the Civil War because they said he was an alcoholic and he's a big drinker. And Lincoln's response was, whatever he's drinking, bring two more barrels to my other officers. Right. You know, yeah, right. That right. was his response because he was a good general. Yeah. So he knew what he was doing. Well, he had actually quit the Army, too, and came back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was mm -hmm. very unsuccessful in everything he did until he uh, until the Civil War. And he was very much like Lincoln in that sense. At, at the uh, surrender, he uh, he was just very low-key, and he... He uh, he told the uh, Lee that we had met one time in the, the Mexican War. Of course, Lee had to remember because I don't know what what his rank was at that time. So, but, okay, uh, the next gentleman to enter office after Grant, President Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, not a whole lot known about Democrat Hayes. Democrat or Republican? I don't know what he was. Republican, I think. He was a president. I mean, you have yeah. Democrats my, for a while. Yeah, my, yeah, my, my <laughs> guess would be Republican. Yeah. The, only other party, the only other party we had was the Whigs, and that was very, very early on. It was the Whigs. W but George, George Washington wasn't one of them. He didn't no, George one. Washington wasn't, wasn't a Whig. He wasn't a Whig. And, uh, and Jefferson was a Republican, but the Republican Party in Jefferson's day had, it was the Democratic nothing, party. had nothing to do with the no, that was Republican they called, Party. Yeah, they called right. it Republican. Then yeah. it was the Democratic Republican, Republicans, and that was the Democrats. Rutherford B. Hayes comes into the White House. The White House gets somewhat run down by this time from the heavy use it got during the Grant administration, even though the Grants were given a tremendous amount of money for refurbishing and redecorating. Um, Hayes was not too well liked, and they would not allow Hayes any money for redecorating because his wife uh, was a very, very beloved White House hostess, Lucy Webb Hayes. However, they nicknamed her Lemonade Lucy. She refused any alcohol in any way, shape, or form to be served in the White House during state dinners, receptions, or anything. Hmm. Uh, Rutherford B. Hayes on the side would have some liquor served at some of his private meetings and things, but if she found out about it, woe to you. Ooh, um, you very, to pay, very, huh? very well respected wife and mother, um, a very loved first lady. Um, but they and, and the Hayes's were very, very much into antiquities, and they loved collecting antiques and things. And during the administration of Chester Arthur, when Arthur had his garage sale, they were big buyers of a lot mm. of the old White House furniture. Well, there's that song that was commemorates. It was a bright golden haze on the metal. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> okay, that, after that Hayes. Was, that was John Ryan again, ladies Hayes and gentlemen. Hayes is seceded. By, anybody have anything on Hayes to add uh, or say here? Anything? One or two terms. I, Single term president. I, I would imagine that uh, the reason for the liquor in that is they had enough of it with uh, U.S. Grant. <laughs> now, was he, yeah. where was Hayes from? Yeah. Was he? Uh, New York? I th no, I think he was Ohio or, yeah, uh, Ohio, I think. From yeah, a Ohio lot of Ohioans, Ohio yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they actually furnished one of their homes. After they left the presidency, they built a home, and they built and they actually furnished a lot of antiques from the White House that they bought during the Arthur administration. Uh, he and Arthur did not get along. Arthur mm -hmm. was actually very corrupt when Arthur was... Chester A. Arthur. Chester was he following him? Arthur. He followed him. Chester A. Arthur was actually um, president of the Port of New York, oh, yeah. which was very corrupt, and it was all done on money on the side and everything like that, and he actually fired him. <laughs> Not known to him that under Garfield's uh, administration, he became the vice president, and on Garfield's death, he became president. So um, you kind of got to watch who you fight. Well, you know, uh, with. you never one know thing about you're going to bump into him again. Boss, one thing about yeah. the vice president's spot, a lot of the parties would kick them there just to bury somebody, get rid of them, because... Yeah. They figured he's not going to go anywhere from there. And then, like, these assassinations happen. That's what they did with Theodore Roosevelt, the reformer or whatever. They sure, they put, him, they put him as the vice president because yeah. they figured they got rid of him. Yeah. He was in New York, and he was the mayor of New York, and they wanted to get rid of him. Because he was cleaning police up commission, New York. Really? He was yeah. police commissioner. He was yeah. cleaning yeah. up New York. Yeah. So they gave him the vice president. They figured he'll disappear. He was never mayor, was he? They never knew McKinley was going to get assassinated well, and well, push him into the presidency. No. Okay, after Mr. Rutherford Burchard Hayes, we have James A. Garfield. Uh, James A. Garfield was the only ordained minister that we ever had as president of the United States. Mm -hmm. um, had a short term in the White House because of an assassination attempt. Went to the tra train station on the 4th of July, Washington, D.C. Went to give a speech and for some 4th of July festivities. Was confronted by an assassin. The man came up almost point blank, shot him through the back and through his arm mm. with a gun. Uh, the bullet lodged inside of him. And even the methods the doctors were using at that time to try to remove the bullet were a little primitive, even for those days. Um, he suffered, suffered terribly through the summer it was so hot in the white mm -hmm. house and they actually put in a real primitive form of air conditioning with ice cubes and ice chunks of ice and piping and fans mm -hmm. to try to cool the president down uh, and it wasn't working out that well so what they actually wound up doing was moving him um, they actually put straw around the White House on the streets and stuff to deaden the noises and stuff mm. to try to keep the president comfortable. And they actually moved him out by boat and took him to a summer home, mm. and that's where he died. And then no, was seceded well. by Chester Arthur. Okay, what what was his denomination? You say he was an ordained minister? I think you know? he was an Episcopal minister. Episcopal. I think that's he like, was Episcopal. Well, yeah. that's like Catholic light, isn't it? Yeah. Those are the people that King Henry took away from the church. There. A very devoted man, a very good president. Um, would have been extremely good president. You know, only trouble is you just didn't get the time to, to prove it. Mm -hmm. Didn't get the time. Was succeeded by his vice president, uh, Chester Allen Arthur. Uh, 
Oh, time to oh, take a break. Let's go. Okay, and that, that happy. <laughs> that happy. Short break. You're listening to the Chicago Historians. Well, friends, guess what? Winter is here, and before we get any more heavy rain or snow, make sure that the, to check your roof and siding and gutters on your home so you don't have any problems with the bad weather. You don't have, if you don't want mold or mildew in your attic or crawl space, you don't want drip, drip, drip on your ceilings in your, in your rooms or have walls damaged by leaky gutters or bad siding. So don't have double expense. Sooner or later, you're going to have to get them repaired. So call Best Brothers Roofing Siding and Gutters at 630-616-1359. Mike Best will drive over in his shiny red truck with ladders on the side and Best Brothers roofing signs on the side doors. And Mike will look over your roof siding and gutters and give you an estimate and go from there. So don't have double expense. Call Best Brothers Roofing for a free estimate at 630-616-1359. That's Best Brothers Roofing siding and gutters at 630-616-1359. Call today for a free estimate. Once again, 630-616-1359. Call now before we get another bad snowstorm and make sure that your gut, your roof, gutters, and siding are in good shape. Best Brothers Roofing, 630-616-1359. We're back. There was a quick, quick, quick uh, bumper there. Okay, looks like we're around the far turn and coming into oh, close to the home stretch. Where were we now, Robert? We just covered James Garfield. We are now uh, on Chester Allen Arthur. This is Robert Kanaziak, Bob Kanaziak, our guest today. Kanaziak. Kanaj- oh, wrong guy. <laughs> Truziak. I know, no, no, old neighbor. One, one of those acts. I was going to say, I don't know who that is. You, you're, you're a hard act to follow. I was going to say, I don't know who that guy is. <laughs> <but> I do. <laughs> Bob Truziak. And uh, he is host and creator of. Uh, Paranormal Radio, yeah. heard over our, our station here. And uh, uh, listen, we're doing a, such a fine job. Can you come back sometime too, please? Certainly. Yeah, I'll come back on. We'll name I'll, a topic. I'll come back on Easter. We'll talk about the Easter Bunny. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I just <laughs> say these things. I don't know. Halloween. Halloween. Oh, yeah. Well, that's that's what I'm busy with, Paranormal. You won't get me. For the month of October, I disappear. You can't get me. Yeah, I'm busy during the month of October. Okay. Nice, Jack. We, we cover James Garfield, the man who succeeded him on his death, Chester Allen Arthur, uh, an accidental president. No one wanted or expected Arthur to get the presidency. Very, very corrupt man when he was in charge of the Port of New York. Uh, very, very corrupt, took money under the table, left and right. Oddly enough, when he became president, he cleaned up his act and cleaned up the government. And he miffed and pissed off a lot of his associates that wanted him to be just as corrupt a president. You see? But he, but he was not. As the show um, says, it takes a thief, right? Yeah, yeah. He, was a, he was a widower. His wife, Ellen, died just a couple of weeks before he entered the White House, unfortunately. Uh, and Arthur, on taking a walkthrough of the White House after Garfield's wife, Lucretia, left... Uh, said, I'm not living in this place. No way. It's just too run down and it's too shabby. And he did a complete walkthrough of the White House and with this staying and that going, you know, and got rid of furniture and did a big um, White House um, garage sale and got rid of 24 wagon loads of a lot of historic furnishings and stuff. He just got rid of He wanted everything new and everything sparkling and everything crystal and shining. And he brought in Louis Comfort Tiffany, who at that time was not in the jewelry business, but they were in the stained glass and the interior, very posh interior decorating business, and did a complete overhaul of decor- redecorating the White House. Um, Arthur left office, tried to run for a second term, did not get it. Fortunately for him, that did not happen because he died not too long after he left office from Bright's disease, which was like a kidney ailment, mm-hmm. and that's what he passed away from. Okay. Anybody that's have anything have. on Arthur? Not, not one of our more well-known presidents. No. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like he was a guy that uh, belonged in there because he knew where uh, he knew <laughs> he knew where all the <laughs> skeletons were hid. Oh yeah, underneath the table. Oh yeah, he did. You, that's you for can't sure. kid yeah. a kidder, right? No. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Cleveland. 
Grover Cleveland. Interesting fact about Grover Cleveland, he's our only president that was elected two terms to office, but not two terms back to back. He served as the 22nd and the 24th president. Uh, Grover Cleveland, at age 46 years old, married very young 21-year-old Frances Folsom Cleveland, who happened to be our youngest first lady. Many people think Jackie Kennedy was the youngest first lady at 32 years of age. It was Frankie Cleveland, who was a very, very popular first lady and hostess. Uh, Frances Cleveland married the 46-year-old... Um, Grover. Grover Thank you. <laughs> she Which married one? Grover Cleveland at 46 years old. They were married in the blue room of the White House because they felt it was the only place they could get some privacy. Uh, during Cleveland's administration, the only child born to a White House uh, to a president in the White House was their child, who was Baby Ruth Cleveland, who the Baby Ruth Candy Bar is named after. Many people think it's named after Babe Ruth, the baseball player. It was named for Baby Ruth Cleveland. Uh, the only child born to a president in the White House. And Cleveland actually developed a cancer in his jaw, and he had to have major surgery done. And this is in the 1880s or late mm. late 1880s. He had a surgery done. They took him away from the White House secretly, did the surgery on the presidential yacht out on the ocean, and um, he actually had part of his jaw was replaced with a rubber artificial jaw. So it was a very sophisticated surgery for that time. He lived through it okay. Um, on their loss of the presidency for the second term when the Clevelands left, they didn't like the White House too much. They found the White House to be very dirty and very uncomfortable and not private at all. Um, but on their leaving the White House, when the Harrisons got, when Benjamin Harrison got elected, they said, don't move any of the furniture, we're going to be back. And they were, <laughs> they got reelected to the next term. After Harrison served one term, they got elected. Um, anything else on Cleveland? What was Cleveland's party? Was he a Republican too? Or? He's yeah. a Democrat. First term, he had a very successful term. His second term, he was not popular at all. Second term, the country fell into a bad economic depression. Mm -hmm. Okay, the man, <coughs> the man who succeeded him after his first term in office was Benjamin Harrison. Uh, Benjamin Harrison was actually the grandson of William Henry Harrison, the man who served the shortest term in office. That was He's actually the grandson of him. Um, the Harrisons had a very relatively calm administration. Uh, Benjamin Harrison's first wife, Caroline Harrison, was the first White House first lady who was a college graduate. Uh, electricity was installed in the White House during the Harrison administration, and the Harrison family were extremely, extremely afraid of electricity and the electric lights, and they would have the servants turn them off and on. And there was a gentleman named Ike Hoover who came into the White House as the White House electrician, and they actually kept him on solely for the purpose of turning the lights on in the evening and turning them off in the morning. They would allow the lights to burn all night long, and in the morning they would click them off. And Boy, those, was, those government jobs, huh? That was his job, and then he became head usher of the White House, and he served all the way up until the administration of Dwight David Eisenhower when he finally Ooh. retired from, from service, yeah. Okay. So that was what year? Uh, no, this was 1892. 80, oh, 1892, yeah. Mm-hmm. 1893, President Cleveland again gets reelected to office, um, has a very, very bad presidency the second time, uh, kind of regretted doing it and said he should have never run again, but he did it, he wanted to, and he was he got it. The uh, country fell into a horrible economic depression, which of course he got blamed for. Uh, he happened to be the president during Chicago's Columbian Exposition, so he came here to flip the switch to start the, um, the 1893 Columbian Exposition. Um, very unpopular president. His wife, Frankie Cleveland, Frances Cleveland, they called, nicknamed her Frankie. Very, very popular and very loved first lady. Um, but him as a president, mm, not so much. Second term really tarnished his image. No. Uh, he died around 1908, and his wife remarried. She remarried the president of some university. I forgot what it was. And she had a couple of children with him. Now, um... He came here to, what, flip the switch? He came here to flip the switch. They started the electricity. That started did he do it or did Ike do it for him, Ike Hoover? <laughs> <laughs> no, Ike Hoover stayed in Washington. He had the White House to take care of. Yeah. <laughs> Just wondered. Yeah. No, he started the Columbian Exposition. He flipped the switch that opened officially opened the exposition. Ike Hoover sounds like an imaginary president, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, during the Hoover administration, when Herbert Hoover was in the White House, he actually had to change his name. He was not called Mr. Hoover. He was called Mr. Usher. <laughs> they didn't want any confusion <laughs> between <laughs> President Hoover and Herbert and, and, <laughs> and Ike Hoover. So they, named, they nicknamed, so everybody addressed yeah. him as Mr. Usher. We're getting ahead of ourselves here. Yeah, yeah, we're jumping ahead. <laughs> Our next president, William McKinley, um, sort of a sad presidency for McKinley. McKinley happened to be president during the Spanish-American War for the nation. A good little war, they called it. Of course, that pushed Teddy Roosevelt to fame with his march up San Juan Hill during the war and the famous battle he fought there. 
Uh, McKinley's wife, Ida McKinley, a very, very idle first lady. Uh, the McKinleys had lost two daughters in infancy some years before. We're a childless couple. Ida McKinley suffered from epileptic seizures. Um, she hardly ever appeared at White House functions. When she did, she went against protocol and was always seated right directly next to the president, which she didn't do. This. She always had some high-ranking male guest and then a high-ranking female guest in between the president and first lady. But the president had the seating rearranged because when she would go into an epileptic seizure, he'd take a handkerchief out of his pocket and throw it over her face when the seizure was over and she'd come out of it. Um, often for White House receptions, she was seated on a platform and always holding a bouquet of flowers not to shake hands and not to have contact with people. Uh, she spent much of her time in the White House in her bedroom and in the White House Conservatory uh, crocheting slippers for charities. And that. So not too much um, with McKinley's, McKinley's administration. Evidently, he wasn't like that much because we don't have a street named after yeah, him. Yeah, well, no, you know, we have Park, McKinley Park. McKinley, Park. McKinley yeah. Park. And then, of course, President McKinley was assassinated. He was. He appeared he at the Buffalo. His second term, then, huh? Yeah, he appeared at the Buffalo yeah. Exposition to give a speech, and a man, um, just before his assassin, a man showed up to shake hands with him in the receiving line with a handkerchief wrapped around his right hand. And so when the president went to extend his right arm to shake hands with him, the man says, oh, left arm, Mr. President, please. And so the president extended his left arm, and the men, the men shook hands. Well, for, after him, the second man after him again had his hand bandaged. And so the president stuck his, he figured, I already know this routine, so he stuck his left arm up, and the man had a gun wrapped up in the banjing, showed the president point blank. Yeah, and poor President McKinley lived through the hot, there again, through the hot summer he lived, and he died in September. And strangely enough, after his death, uh, for the next eight years, his wife, Ida McKinley, never again had another epileptic seizure after his death. Yeah. So he was succeeded by? Oh, T.R. Go ahead. Talk about T.R., you guys. Everybody knows facts mm. about T.R. Go ahead. I'll throw it to you. Bully, bully, hunting, right? The Wally teddy bear. Some, go ahead. They just had that big, uh, uh, oh, what did it go, for weeks on Channel 11? Oh, did you watch any of the PBS? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, from wealth and privilege? Oh, extreme, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what, what time you got one? Well, a uh, uh, great outdoorsman. Right. Uh, our national park system, I believe, right. is a result of... Uh, exactly. Of, he was uh, the guy President that he President said, Roosevelt. He said of this particular national wonder, he, uh, natural wonder, every American should be able to see this, and it was talking about the Grand Canyon, and I think that's... I uh, was married twice. His first wife died in childbirth. Actually, he lost his wife and mother almost like a couple of days apart yeah, mm -hmm. he lost them both but he did have a daughter with the first wife alice roosevelt um and then he of course remarried edith roosevelt and they had five children together and alice became very hard to control <laughs> during his presidency uh, she was a very outspoken woman she smoked cigarettes she liked to drive a car she liked to do all sorts of things she wasn't supposed to be doing uh, she was a very outspoken um presidential daughter My kind of gal <laughs> she was she was married in the white house um a big fuss was made about the white house wedding and tr finally made the comment he says i can do one of two things i can be president of the united states or i can be the father of alice roosevelt <laughs> yeah uh tr had a lot of firsts first president to ride in an automobile uh first president to actually have an automobile in the white house um first president to ride in an airplane he rode in a submarine did a lot of things it was actually assassination attempt put on his life too he got shot and wounded by it, but went on with the speech and everything and, and did that. I know about diplomacy. He, he was quoted with the, uh, speak softly and carry a big stick, you know, mm -hmm. just like today. <laughs> right. He, he um, also was the fifth uh, cousin of uh, FDR. Mm -hmm. Cousin of FDR yeah. and uncle of Eleanor. He actually mm -hmm. gave Eleanor, Eleanor's father had died. Eleanor's uh, father, Elliot, and T.R. were brothers, and Eleanor's father, Elliot, was an alcoholic and died from alcoholism, mm -hmm. and Teddy Roosevelt actually gave away the bride, Eleanor, at, their, at the wedding. Yeah, so the Roosevelts had money. There are actually two factions, politically, of the Roosevelt family. There were Republican Roosevelts and there were Democratic Roosevelts, mm -hmm. and the T.R. Roosevelts, the Teddy Roosevelts, were the Republicans, and the FDR Roosevelts, those were the Republicans. And there was a friction. Oh, extreme, extreme friction amongst them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, there was... Uh, Go ahead. Go, Nigo. No, go ahead, Red. I was going to say, one of the big mistakes T.R. did, and he put his foot in his own mouth doing this, uh, was, of course, he got to be president on McKinley's death. So he served McKinley's term, and then he got elected on his own. And he could have served another term. And he said, I will not run for another term. And he realized, oh, mm -hmm. I just put a big blunder, because he really wanted the presidency again. He loved being in the limelight. Mm -hmm. uh, what was said about T.R. was T.R. liked to be the bride at the wedding. He liked to be the corpse at the funeral. He liked to be the baby <laughs> at the christening. He wanted to be the one in the limelight. He loved being out in the public. That's what he excelled at. And so he kind of killed his, you know, next on running for the presidency again, which later on, he tried to do that again. He put his friend, 
William Howard Taft into the presidency. Uh, Taft never really wanted it. He liked to be the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He had a very brilliant legal mind, but Taft was kind of pushed into the presidency by his good friend Teddy Roosevelt and by his own wife, uh, Helen Taft. They kind of pushed him into it. So he did it, and then of course when he was trying to run for re-election, TR told him to get out. TR wanted to run. So TR actually mm -hmm. wasn't running as a Republican or a Democrat. He ran on the Bull Moose Party, which progressive was progressive Republicans. Yeah, yeah, which was yeah. which was not not successful yeah. at all, and he made a big blunder with that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. wasn't he the man? Uh, somebody said a hunter, but didn't he get a very bad uh, like malaria or something on that? Did that d do him in? Malaria or? actually happened to him a little later. After he left office, he still remained active. And what he did is he took a trip down the Amazon. He, took a, he, took, he was big on big game hunting and this kind of mm -hmm. stuff, so he took a trip down the Amazon River and actually caught malaria, mm -hmm. and he died in 1918. He actually died a little heartbroken, too, because one son, Archie, one of their sons, died in the First World War. He was a, he was a pilot, and he died well, in a plane well, crash. Well, he wanted to be activated to fight in the First World War. And he the, actually wanted to come out of retirement mm -hmm. at his age, which in those days, the 60s in those days, was very oh, old. Yeah. yeah, And he wanted to come out of retirement and actually take uh, take an army again in the First World War. And he says, I think you better sit in the rocking chair there, Mr. President. Mm -hmm. no, you know, kind of call it quits. <clears throat> There's a film called The Wind and the Lion with Sean Connery and uh, Candace Bergen and she's kidnapped in North Africa, Morocco or wherever it was, uh, Algeria. And uh, it's based on a real story, but in the real in real life, it was a businessman who was kidnapped, not a woman. Brian Keith plays Ro Ro uh, Teddy Roosevelt in it. But the real, the real quotation about rescuing the person, he told his troops, if they're Marines or whatever, <coughs> he wants so-and-so alive or Ali Pasha dead. So there was no mincing your words there, you know, and that's... yeah. Kind of what well, T -T TR, we can go on and on and on. There's many, many TR stories. Uh, the man who succeeded TR to the White House was handpicked by TR himself, and that was his good friend, William Howard Taft, one of our largest presidents. Taft, uh, he towered over 300 pounds, a very jovial, good-natured man. Everyone around the White House loved him and everything until he actually became president. When he became the president, his, his mood changed. He did not like the presidency at all. He was not happy in the presidency. He was pushed into it by his wife and by President T.R. to take it. Um, he would often fall asleep during presidential functions and state dinners and receptions and um, just was not happy with the president. He had a very, very brilliant legal mind uh, and always wanted to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, which eventually he did get. In 1920, he was appointed to the Supreme Court, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court by President Warren G. Harding. So Taft, not a very happy presidency for Mr. Taft. Um, Taft happened to be succeeded by Mr. Woodrow Wilson, a Republican president, succeeded him. Uh, Wilson had the misfortune again of being president during a, a, a crisis, the First World War with this country. Um, Wilson had two wives. He was actually married in the White House. Uh, his first wife, Ellen Gainsborough Wilson, died when he was in the White House. And then within a year's time, um, to everyone's surprise, he met and remarried I think her name was Edith, Gol uh, Edith Galt Wilson. Uh, she was a widow, too, and he remarried her. Yeah. Uh, ta um, Wilson suffered a stroke in the White House after the First World War. Um, he ran on the ticket uh, and got reelected on the fact that he kept us out of the war and this, but eventually we had no choice but to get into the First World War. And uh, after the war was over, he was really, really pushing for the League of Nations, which was a forerunner of the United Nations, really pushed for this and really campaigned for this and was running for the election again and everything and overworked himself and actually gave himself a stroke. Mm -hmm. And during his last um, months in office, his wife, uh, the second Mrs. Wilson, actually took over the White House and she signed bills and she mm -hmm. signed papers and everything. And this was causing a lot of people, too, because no one, everybody said no one elected her. What is she doing with all now, this? Now, um, um, he was president. Was it Princeton before he was? Yeah, that was that was his big slogan. He says, "What is what is the president of a school doing running a war?" Well, he yeah. was yeah, he was also from Savannah, Georgia. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. so people don't even realize. Well, plus I th I think that was probably around the time where the Republican Party kind of you know morphed into the present Republican Party, and as opposed to you know I, uh, people that talk about. The Republican Party is as racists, and uh, the Party of the Rich yeah. to have, have very uh, limit, limited knowledge of what the original Republican mm -hmm. Party was. The Republic, the Party of uh, Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. Yeah, when, no, Lincoln, no. when Lincoln took office, I think the party was like seven years old. Funny you should mention, Tom. Um, following the Civil War, the uh, all federal offices were integrated. You could, you know, no matter which race was, you could serve in it. The, the armed forces were. It was Woodrow Wilson who resegregated them. Not, I mean, Republican, Woodrow Wilson. Right. So, 
And the um, the White House itself, um, the White House itself was very, very segregated. Mm -hmm. um, traditionally, domestic help and servants and doormen and this and that in the White House were all traditionally black help, African American help, uh, and they were very, very segregated. You actually had a separate dinner time for black employees, separate dinner time for white employees. They sat at separate tables. Uh, the first lady who actually served as a personal maid to one of the first ladies was a lady na named na uh, Maggie Rogers. Uh, Maggie. Go. Ten minutes left for the show. We got a lot of presidents to cover. We, we can go over a little. We're going to have to do them real fast. <laughs> anyway, she be, she became a president. Because she, got, she came in during the administration of William Howard Taft because Mrs. Taft wanted a lady uh, servant there that could do hairdressing. So Maggie Rogers was skilled in it, so she became the first African-American to actually <laughs> serve on the presidential family mm -hmm. force. Uh, White House was kept very segregated. Woodrow Wilson, Warren G. Harding. Warren G. Harding became president after Wilson. Um, he, a lot of people said he got elected on his looks because it was the first year women got the right to vote, and he was a handsome, considered a handsome man. Uh, married to Florence <coughs> Harding, a few years his senior, a childless couple, although his wife had had a child by a previous marriage. Um, very, very corrupt president, very corrupt administration, um, kind of handpicked to be in the office like that, um, wanted to be a good president, but didn't turn out that way. Uh, fortunately for him, after his untimely death from a stroke, um, the teapot, whole Teapot Dome scandal came out, and that uh, about insider trading and, and corruption with that, and that came out after he um, died. So fortunately, it didn't tarnish him while he was in office. Uh, he was succeeded by a good, kind of a good president there, Mr. Calvin Coolidge, who happened to be the vice president. Silent Cal? Silent Cal. Never said too much. Uh, didn't talk a whole lot. And Coolidge succeeded um, Warren G. Harding. Was the president through the Roaring Twenties. Um, a very popular president. Content to let the business of America be business itself. Uh, saw the Depression coming in 1929. Could have easily run again for a third term. And his big thing he said, if he ever said anything in his life, was, I do not choose to run. He chose not to do it because he says he saw the Depression coming and there was no way he saw of staving it off. Uh, he was a very thrifty and frugal New Englander from Vermont himself. Uh, he actually reduced the national deficit to zero. The only second time in history that's been done. And he managed to do that, but he says he couldn't impose his thrifty ways on the rest of the country, and spending went rampant, and he says that led to the Depression. Um, he was, of course, succeeded by Mr. Herbert Hoover. Hoover, of course, got the bad rap for the Depression, although he himself had nothing directly to do with it. He just had the misfortune of coming in when it was at its worst. Um, Hoover did put in a lot of policies and a lot of things. Uh, one of the most unpopular things he did was he would not approve the bond issue for servicemen from World War I. Uh, the government had owed them this money and he refused to pay it. Very unpopular. He actually called in federal troops to clear them out of Washington and clear out their little Hooverville mm -hmm. that people did with shanties and you know cardboard boxes and stuff people were living in. Uh, he got them cleared out. Very, very unpopular president. Um, Anybody that lived was old enough to live through the Hoover years, they kind of vote him as the worst president we ever had. Although many of the p things and stuff that he put into policy were stuff that actually Franklin Roosevelt built on and built the New Deal on. So a lot of things he started, and Hoover himself said, he says, you know, I'm starting a lot of policies and things, and no one's ever going to know it, uh, that I did this. And it was true. He kind of became forgotten about it. Lived to the ripe old age of 90 years old. In actuality, they expected President Hoover, like when President Kennedy was assassinated, um, they were expecting President Hoover to die. So they had everything ready for Hoover's funeral, and then, gosh, just by fate, uh, Kennedy got assassinated. So that's why Kennedy's uh, funeral and everything was so well organized, because they actually had it ready for Hoover, and Hoover lived till the next oh, year. Is that true? I'm yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. FDR, well, we kind of covered FDR. I don't know if we're going to say any more about FDR. Yeah, we did talk about it earlier. Yeah. Harry Truman, of course, is seated FDR. Give him hell, good old give him hell, Harry. Would prove um, that he was uh, someone who was the right guy for the job, too. Yeah. At mm -hmm. that time, yes. Yeah. Okay, after Harry Truman, we'll kind of go through these fast to get through them in the next few minutes here. Funny we uh, should mention. Ike Eisenhower, anybody have anything to say about Dwight? I don't great guy. Yeah, great guy. He great had, guy. He had his girlfriend, too, that he had during the war. He had mm -hmm. Mamie, his first lady. Um, he actually came into the White House after Truman's had just remodeled it, redecorated it, and actually mm -hmm. rebuilt it. So they came in at a good time. Central air conditioning was it, put in, so the uh, Eisenhower's came in at a good time. History is much more kinder to uh, Eisenhower is that he... My dad called him the chairman of the board. At least he surrounded himself with people who were experts in their And he knew that from the yeah. military. Yeah. Yeah. A good guy. Yeah, he was military. Right, right. Yeah. Limited, limited uh, personal involvement in the office. Yeah, traditionally, yeah. presidents that have served in the military seem to make better presidents. They're a little more organized. They're a little more, you know, used to dealing with that kind of stuff. A little more used to giving orders. So they kind of make better presidents. Uh, John F. Kennedy, gosh, I don't know what we need to say about Kennedy that we don't already know and what we don't already, you know, have said about that. Well, we know that someone is remembered as an assassinated president yeah. and that uh, overshadows everything. Uh, the sad thing about Kennedy is Kennedy did not win the election by very much. He oh. kind of snuck in. He didn't win it by much. But strangely enough, after his death, how many people said they 
they voted for him. <laughs> that didn't, you know. They just wanted to stand behind him. Got to check the uh, yeah. Lake Michigan those machines. Unfortunately for him, he had the potential to show a good presidency, a very shining administration, but time cut him short. He had a lot of ability. A lot yeah. of, didn't have a lot of personal yeah. ability. We okay, then we have Lyndon Johnson. I don't know how much we need to say about Johnson. We kind of lived through his his presidency there. He uh, was the course. he was the only president that was sworn in by a uh, a female. Yep, that's true. On the yeah. plane, yeah, he was sworn On in. The plane. Yeah. Yeah. Also, too, after Kennedy's assassination, never again would a president and vice president be in the first same motorcade because they were actually in the same motorcade. Yeah. And they think that Johnson, it, which is really strange, they think he actually had something to do with Kennedy's assassination. Yes. Was yeah, never approved. Of, yeah, was never approved, yeah. but he was actually yeah. accused of that. All his life he was accused of it and always had to defend himself against that. He was succeeded by Triggy Dick. We all know about Richard Nixon. Uh, Nixon, again, had the potential to be a very good president. He did a lot that people just don't yes, realize. Yes, had it, had it well, not been something. for I'll that Don Watergate. How's that? Yeah, had oh, it not I'm been working. for Watergate, Nixon had the potential yeah. to be a very good president. One of the things I like to point out about Nixon's administration was uh, Nixon one time got a call from the king. The king showed up at the White House Drive at the gates, and security said, yeah. security said, Mr. President, the king is here to see you. What and he says, what uh, king? I'm not expecting any official visits from anybody. The, the, and he yeah, says, yeah, yeah. the king. is the king of rock and roll. Mr. Elvis Presley is yeah. here. Elvis Presley drove by the White House, decided he wanted to see the president. And he says, well, all right, give me about 40 minutes and usher him in. And they did so. Elvis was so nervous. Now, here's a man that appeared you know, in front of thousands of people performing. Was so nervous to go in and meet the president in the Oval Office. Two security guards had to hold him by the arm came in, the two men exchanged pleasantries. Uh, Elvis was told him he was very much concerned with drug addiction and drug, drug abuse. Nixon made him an honorary member of his uh, Committee Against Drugs, War Against Drugs. And the two men showed pictures, Elvis showed pictures of his daughter. The president showed him pictures of his grandchildren. And the two men exchanged pleasantries, and that was that. And Elvis had a gun for him or something as a gift. He did. Which yeah. he couldn't yeah. have right with him. When no, he absolutely not. He couldn't no. bring it in. No, by yeah. security reasons, he couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, of course, Nixon resigned from office. We know the horrible thing with the Watergate and that. He jumped ship and resigned from office and was succeeded by Gerald Ford, short-term in presidency, only two years. Uh, Ford, uh, kind of an accidental president. There again, a man that never sought the presidency, was Speaker of the House, got it by secession on Agnew's resignation as vice president. He became vice president. On Nixon's resignation as president, he became president. <coughs> and uh, Gerald Ford blew it for his reelection when he pardoned Nixon. Uh, he, he, he gave a presidential pardon to Richard Nixon for any wrongdoings, and many people felt that was so wrong, they wanted Nixon punished. They wanted to see Nixon hung, not literally, but they wanted to see him hung. Uh, and Ford said, no, he, he says, I knew I blew the election, but I felt in my heart it was the right thing to do. So that was that. Uh, Jimmy Carter, our next president after Ford. And not too much we can say about Carter, kind of a blundered presidency. Mm -hmm. um, actually, President uh, Carter is actually much, much better as an ex-president than he was as a president. Intelligent, but very, very shrewd. Yes, yeah. a very, very hard-working ex-president, does a lot for Habitat Humanity, very liked and respected, although his presidency, not so good. His, uh, doing, I say this one thing, if we go over a little bit, don't worry about this. Yeah, don't okay. rush yourself. Oh, all right, I was going to, I'm yeah, rushing through it here. Uh, uh, Carter, much like today, he was accepting... He told Castro, we'll take how many people out of your prison, thinking you were going to get political prisoners. Like 20,000 was the number, maybe more. So Castro sent every murder, murder every rapist, every drug pusher, every kidnapper he could here. And someone later said he couldn't have done any better if he landed a 20,000-man force at our shores. So we've got to learn something from that anyway. Next case. Okay, after Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter, too, unfortunately, had the very misfortune of being president during one of this country's worst energy crises, where we had the gas shortages and we had the long lines at the gas pumps, and he decided to come on TV and try to revive FDR's fireside speeches, where the president took off his sports jacket or his jacket from his suit and was wearing a sweater and standing in front of the fireplace. Only problem with that was the fireplace wasn't lit, so it didn't quite have the effect of the, of the warming fire with the president sitting in a sweater, so he kind of blew it there. A uh, very unpopular president, unfortunately, for Mr. Carter. A very beloved man, very deeply religious. Um, unfortunately for him, he just was not a good president. The economy was terrible. Uh, horrible it, it economy was a, during it was the another uh, no Double-digit inflation. Yeah. It was another no alcohol in the White House, I Absolutely believe. not. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, him and his wife Rosalind, very much uh, about that. Although his brother Billy, quite the contrary, with the Billy <laughs> beer and everything. Right. Yeah. I remember the joke during that time was between Billy and him, um, uh, and Dolly Parton was very popular. Who's got the biggest boobs in the, two biggest boobs in the country? And the uh, answer was Miss Lillian, <laughs> <laughs> their mother. <laughs> the two brothers, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
Jimmy Carter was succeeded by Mr. Ronald Reagan. Many, many people felt Reagan is one of our greatest presidents, one of the best ones we had. Uh, Reagan's On Reagan's election, the hostages got released. That all happened when Carter, that was another very unpopular thing for poor President mm -hmm. Carter. Uh, they had took, Iranian people had taken the hostages and he sent some helicopters over to try to free them. Uh, the rescue attempt was bundled and the helicopters crashed. Uh, poor Carter, nothing seemed to go right for him. Ronald Reagan came into office and said, get those people out of there, and they did. They were afraid of Reagan, they were afraid of a war, so they released them. Uh, Reagan did a lot for the country. Um, his wife, Nancy, not too popular a first lady. More popular now as an ex-first lady than she was as a first lady. Uh, she was seen as somewhat snooty and somewhat above everybody else, not like a president's, his, you know. His uh, first wife was... Uh, a little more down-to-earth. Uh, yeah, Jane yeah, yeah. yeah, she was yeah. a little more down-to-earth. Everybody felt Nancy Reagan was a little stuck up. Yes. Uh, she came under heavy criticism for her belief in the mystical and the supernatural and holding seances in the White House. Uh, so, you know, they had their little problems there with that. But nonetheless, Ronald Reagan was a fairly good president. Uh, he froze minimum wage for the eight years he was in office. Minimum wage stayed the same. So how really about that, Tom? Move. That, <laughs> was, not, that <laughs> was not you a remember popular that? move that he did. Yeah. Was that, no, that, Nixon? No, that, that was Nixon? Oh, Nixon. Right, that was Nixon. And unfortunately for Ronald Reagan, towards the end of his second term, you could start, and start to see the effects of Alzheimer's starting to kick in. He was getting a little forgetful. Uh, things were happening. He happened to be coached with his speeches, so you could see it kind of coming. And unfortunately, he did end up with Alzheimer's and uh, then died from that. Um, survived an assassination attempt and broke the curse. Mm -hmm. We had that. We had that curse of the odd, the odd year, uneven year presidential assassination. He broke that curse because he survived the assassination attempt. And of course, he was succeeded by George Bush, the first one, the father, George Bush, mm -hmm. his yeah. vice president. Yeah. Four years as a president, two men actually ran against each other in the election, and they struck a deal and said, I'll make you the vice president, and you get it the next time. And that's exactly what happened. Um, Bush kind of came into <coughs> office, sort of a do-nothing president, not too well liked. Um, his way of speech, a lot of people made fun of it. Uh, his wife, Barbara Bush, a very, very popular first lady, very grandmotherly and very well liked and very well beloved. For Still what she was. Yeah, very, very well beloved. Well, one thing about George H.W., <coughs> there probably was no one was with a better background to become president. He'd been senator. He'd been a uh, director of the CIA. Was a war hero. War II, was, was actually shot down in the war. Yeah. Yeah. What else? And, yeah. and, a, and a big businessman. Yeah. So you know, he knew how to run it. He looked at the whole. You know. Whole Go ahead. Next case. Okay. That's, that covers George Bush, the father of George Bush, the first George Bush. Okay. He was succeeded by a man who we all know and love, Bill Clinton. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. One of his more famous sayings. You too? Um, Clinton is actually... Oh! Speak, that's right. Speak. Huh? Hey! Speak. Speak. You got something to say? Kate doesn't like... Well, she's a, she didn't right, like Clinton. A, the, 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 only, the, the, only, the only female that's here is barking about Bill Clinton. Yeah, that's Kate, <laughs> that's Kate the puppy. Kate, you got something to say? Can you get her to bark? Come on. Speak. Oh, oh. Come on. Oh, uh, this is what you just speak. said. Uh, Je Jeanette, she's Jeanette uh, Frontier had to leave already, oh. folks. That's oh, right. Speak. Jeanette, right. right. Yeah, she, uh, it's coming out. It's like... Uh, there she goes. is out on assignment. There's Kate. Okay. Okay, so Bill Clinton, I don't know what we need to say about him. We kind of know um, everything there that went on. We all lived through that. It was in our recent memories, not too Clinton far away. Clinton was uh, a very much likable guy. Tom and I knew a guy yeah. from the old neighborhood was very much like this. You might have liked One the thing guy, Bill Clinton but it was did. trouble. One no. thing Bill Clinton did right. that was good, and a lot of people don't realize he even did it, uh, actually, he was one of two presidents that reduced the national deficit to zero when they left office. Mm. Right. We had a good economy. We well, had boom years. We had a lot to do with the Congress. With the, with the help of a Republican Congress. Yeah, yeah. and uh, Newt the Gingrich. Only, the only other president in history that did that was Calvin Coolidge. When he left office, we had a zero deficit, and then, of course, the Depression clicked. What in. happened since then, for God's sake? Yeah. But Bill Lord. Clinton left with a zero deficit, and then right after that, during the, the second Bush's years, everything went to hell in a handbasket. And there again, not laying the blame on the son, George Bush, you know, but um, that's what happened. Okay, we skip Bill Clinton, we go to George Bush, that's our next president. George W. Bush. George W. Bush. W. Um, what do we got to say about him? I liked him. Yeah, okay. I liked him. Right. I give him about a 70, 70, 70 grade in my, what I yeah. think. Did he, did, was the election fixed or was it unfixed? With the tie-up no, being in Florida, whose See, brother happened to be the governor of Florida. Well, no, no. I, yeah, I don't no. know. There, you know, there, no, yeah, it's you know, some speculation people, about that. Yeah. yeah. How many people said when they're talking about the electoral votes and the popular said? I heard them say, "When did they start that?" And I said, "Once well, the beginning of seven. I was say, since yeah. the beginning of the presidency. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's been around. They just don't understand that. So that's it. And there again, another president, maybe not so popular, not well liked, but Laura Bush, very beloved, very well liked. Uh, Laura Bush, actually, many people don't know this. She said this after she left office. She actually was responsible for the death of someone with her car. 
She actually killed someone in her car when she was younger with some girlfriends in the car. Yeah. They were out joyriding, and they actually had a crash, and she actually killed someone in the car. Mm -hmm. She always felt hurt about that. She never it was never convicted of anything or anything like that. It was accidental death. He was very well liked with the military. Well liked. With yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. She was hot. <laughs> okay, that leads us up to number 44, soon to leave office, President Barack Obama. Uh. Okay. Okay, not too well liked now, kind of this way and that way. Um, came in, I think, with a lot of high hopes, a lot of ideas, and like so many presidents that came before him, I think he's leaving off as disappointed. Um, I think every one of these 44 that we talked about, mm. I don't think there's a one of them that went into the office that said, I wanted to be a horrible president. Cool. I think they all went in with good intentions, and they realized the frustration of the office and what they could and could not accomplish. I think by the end of their four years or their eight years, if they served the two terms, I think they're just happy and relieved to be rid of the office because it really that's ages them. Well, that's well, like the city of Chicago police department right now looking for a new police superintendent and the whole feeling out there is who in the hell would want that job yeah that's how it goes yeah the presidency is that way too i ask myself yeah. that question a lot i says i don't know why anybody would take 10 million dollars out of their own pocket to run for an office that pays four hundred fifty thousand dollars a year but it's the prestige and this you know yep. the posterity you're remembered for eternity as a president and that kind of thing and like i said i don't think any of them i don't like to come down on any of them i think they all went in with the best of intentions but Unfortunately, for a lot of them, it didn't work out that way. Can Wait you a minute, imagine hold on. what this election right now is costing when when it gets over with costing all of these people put together? Oh, certainly, it You're costs a lot of money. You're talking about a yeah. trillion dollars. Oh, sure, it costs a lot of money uh, to be president. Yeah. Boy. Our uh, our chaplain, Father O'Fondlin, just come in here. He wanted to say something. Can he spoke him up? Go right ahead. Yes, hello, Robert. You say that all these men had good intentions. <laughs> Don't you know that the Road to hell is paved with good intentions. That's all. Thank you, Father. <laughs> that, vo that father sounded very familiar. It seems like I met him somewhere before. I don't know. Yeah, it's in the confessional. Red-headed <laughs> guy. Yeah. Yes. you got to watch those redheads. Well, huh? that's what I had to say about the well, presidents and the presidency. And Well, we've, uh, we've had a really good show, and, uh, and thank you for bringing everything. Your recordings and your intellect. Yeah, and very, your, nice. Your very nice. Try to do something different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, it's... Uh, um, it's, it's it was a, a small panel today, so I got to. T I, if you had your well, full complement of people like you normally do, I wouldn't have got to talk that yeah. much. So it's easier to yeah. manage sometimes too. Yeah, yeah. our last very one was a so. smaller panel too, and was a very worked, good show. So worked out. Maybe worked we're learning out, something. It here. worked out great. Break. What's the? This is the final. Are we ready to go? I'm talked out. I'm done. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> On behalf of uh, Jeanette Frontier, Bob Trazik. Rob, come in. Okay, okay. You got it. Okay, we're going. Until the next time, remember, folks, history is much more than a, a book you keep on your shelf. We'd like to thank you all for listening. We would also like to thank Kevin of Jack FM, WRHS 89.7 FM, and Smooth FM, WRWX 88.1 for broadcasting our shows over the Ridgewood Radio Network. Recordings of previous Meet the Chicagoans, uh, excuse me, Recordings of previous Meet the Chicago Historians programs are available for your listening via the Internet at www.windycityhometown.com. Thank you for listening. You have been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians from the John DeVita Broadcast Center on Monday, February the 15th, the year 2016. This broadcast was produced by Jack Ryan, directed by John DeVita, our audio engineer James Rohde, and the executive producer of Whitney City Hometown Entertainment Network, Mr. John Secondo. Until next time, thank you for listening. Have a good day, everyone.